Hi, Michelle, do you want to test your microphone real quick? Hi, everybody. Great. We're just, uh, Leah's working hard to get you up on the screen in the room, but at least we have you in the Zoom space, and that's the first step. <laughs> Thank you. Just yep. curious, not that I really want to know, but is like my face like a on a giant screen in the room? Not okay. yet, but it will be. <laughs> but it will be. Okay. Yeah. And then I'll you can see on Zoom. I'm trying we to. Can, Zoom. Yes, sir. Folks from home can see this room. We just don't have it up on our screen. So it's not ideal, but it's also not. Oh. Like we, we like, should be able to still start, but I'm hoping to figure it out in a couple of minutes. Okay. Leah, is it perhaps because they're using that new Is the room that was the room that you're in invited, Leah? as its own entity, because I think that's what we have to do. Leah, Samantha is back online too. Hi, I'm here. That's it for that one. Hi. Sam, thank you. Oh, that's a close up of me. Sorry. Jeff, Jeff figured it out. So we are all set. I'm going to mute just for a few minutes, Brenda, until we're ready to start. Great. So you're all set in the room. That's so yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> thank well, you, Jeff. And just to confirm, you can't see my icon. Is that correct, Brenda? You don't. Okay, that, great. that is correct. Yeah, and folks at home will not be able to see you. Um, they can only see people that have their cameras on. Okay, thank you. If um, mm -hmm. anything is needed, on the, I can still access everything. Um, I just have the box hidden so that uh, the main speakers are seen. Excellent. That's great. Thank you. Leah, can I ask a question? I can ask it in Teams if that's easier for you. I'll do that.
right. I restarted the recording. Welcome to everybody, and I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Open Space Board of Trustees for January 11th, 2023. My name is Karen Holweg, and I'm the chair of the Open Space Board of Trustees, and uh, next is our roll call. John? Present. Dave? Here. Caroline? Present. Michelle? Here. Uh, so we have a full house with everybody here tonight. Um, and next, Brenda Rittenauer, would you please go over the rules of the meeting? Sure. Hello. Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to play the role formerly known as Allison Eklund this evening um, and help out with public participation at the meeting and going over our meeting expectations. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And you all will let me know if you can see that all right. Looks good. Okay, great. Um, so I apologize, my screen's over here, so I'll be looking this way, but uh, I am here with you. Um, just a reminder, I know some who are with us tonight may have heard this many times, um, others may have not. So thank you for your patience while I go over these. Um, just a reminder to all of you and to let those of you who are new know, the city has worked closely with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision is designed to support the physical and emotional safety for community members, for staff, and for board members, um, trustee members, as well as democracy for people of all ages, all identities, lived experience, and political perspectives. Um, if you want to learn more about this vision and about the community engagement process we use to get to this vision, um, you can go on the website bouldercolorado.gov and in the search box just put in productive atmospheres and there's a lot of lovely information there about it. Um, for tonight we have some examples of rules of decorum that are found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that we use at the city that support this vision. These will be upheld during tonight. <laughs> Oh, we got some feedback. I think we're okay. Um, all remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business and to the, meet, the business of this meeting here tonight. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person. Obscenity, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. Participants are required to use the name they're commonly known by and individuals must display their whole name before being allowed to speak online. Currently, currently only audio testimony is permitted. Um, and some people may have signed up in advance and others of you will be, um, will be able to raise your hand when the time comes for comments from the public. And thank you. When we come to that time, I will do a reminder on um, how to find that raise hand button. Great, thank you very much, Brenda. Mm -hmm. Um, the next item on our agenda is approval of the minutes for the December 14th meeting. And I'd like to ask the members of the board um, if there are any corrections, clarifications, additions to the minutes of the December 14th meeting. I have three small um, clarifications, uh, Leah. And uh, under agenda item three, the third line down, which ends as well as if you could insert HCA and natural area <coughs> designations. I think that it helped. Um, and then at the top of the next page, just again, a couple minor things. Um, on the second line, how this differs with, and then I put in quote, the city manager rule, unquote, process. And delete the word approval. And then on the last line of that paragraph, um, in relation to user conflict, insert the word user before conflict. Okay. 
Those are the only three suggestions I have. Anybody else? No, but just to double check, you said um, with the second line city manager rule and then just yeah. approval? Correct. City manager rule process and, and delete approval, as you said. You provoked a comment from Karen. Okay. Um, Leah, under agenda item three uh, in the first paragraph, uh, the acronym BERT, all in capital letters, it strikes me. Can we spell that out mm -hmm. so that uh, people who didn't participate in the conversation knows what that is? Boulder something regional trail. Boulder to Erie. Oh, Boulder to Erie regional trail. Good. <laughs> okay, any other comments? Suggestions. Is there a motion to approve the revised minutes? I so move. Second. Second. Caroline moved and and uh, Dave seconded a motion to approve the minutes of December fourteenth as revised. Um, I guess we have to do a roll call vote Please. again. Um, Michelle? I'll abstain. Oh, you weren't at the I meeting. was absent. Sorry. Yep, I'll abstain. Sorry, you weren't at the meeting. Um, Caroline? Yes. John? Yes. Dave? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So the minutes are approved as amended. And we are now now working to plug in things so that batteries won't go down. I just wanted Allison to know how much we miss her in this room. <laughs> Allison, if you're watching, we miss you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Leah. Um, before we go on with the agenda, I just want to point out for anybody who might be um, participating in the meeting who is not previously aware of the fact that the uh, consideration of a recommendation to council regarding e-biking on open space and mountain parks lands has been moved to the February 8th Open Space Board of Trustees business meeting. So we will not be dealing with that at this January meeting. Our agenda includes um, three other major sections. The next section is public comment for items that are not involved in a public hearing. And since we have no public hearing on this agenda, um, at, at this next moment in time is the public's opportunity to comment at this meeting. There'll be, that's the only opportunity for public comment tonight. Um, then we'll proceed with matters from the board and then matters from the department. Under the matters from the department agenda item, we'll be dealing with the 2022 annual Prairie Dog update and 2023 Prairie Dog management plans, and with the South Boulder Creek environmental mitigation and floodplain restoration. Um, and as I said before, there will be no public comment on any of those items. So um, if you have signed up for public comment, uh, Brenda has your name on a list. If you have not yet signed up for public comment and would like to speak to us tonight, please raise your hand or type something into the chat. Both are fine. And Brenda can go over it again briefly, too. Okay. Brenda, it's all yours. And we'll have three minutes each for public comment tonight. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, yes, if you would like to speak, um, please do raise your hand. You'll find a raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. Um, it should be easy to find, but if it's not, Karen, you can reach out to me in the Q&A box, and I am happy to add you to the list. The raised hand just helps me um, keep track of all of you. So if you can find it, that's great. Um, so at the moment, we have four people with hands up, um, but we will start with our previously signed up folks, although I'm only seeing one of those people here in the meeting with us. So Paula Schuler, we will start with you, um, and I will enable your microphone, and Leah will have the timer in her. Leah will share the timer so that you'll be able to see it. 
And so we'll get that up before you begin, Paula, so that you know you have your full time. Okay. okay. And you can um, hear me. Ready to start. We can hear you. Very good. Hi, my name is Paula Schuler, and I live in the Prairie Dog Project area. I've been involved in the Prairie Dogs on Irrigated Land conversation for many years. I just want to say that overall, I've been very pleased with progress that OSMP is making in the project area. It's great to see many of the pastures recovering and returning to full productivity productivity. I'm anxious to see how some of the more degraded parcels can recover in the coming years. It all seems very promising. One of the things I do not like is how the number of acres treated is declining each year. When this program was passed, council allowed 100 to 200 acres of lethal control and 40 acres of relocation. Yet for 2023, it seems then less than 100 acres will be lethally controlled and perhaps 40 will be relocated. I'm not clear on the final decision. Prairie dog removal in the project area will decre decrease dramatically this year, yet prairie dog numbers are at an all time high and there are still 668 acres in, in conflict. I've been told the number of acres being treated are down mainly because of contractor issues and barrier costs. I would like OSMP and OSBT to consider the following. Purchase two six hose perk machines for approximately $17,000 each and begin treating some of the parcels using seasonal workers. These machines would be a one time investment of less than $40,000. There are four hose machines that cost around $15,000. There are also two hose units that are produced in Brighton, Colorado that could be used for small reoccupation and follow up maintenance that sell for $2,600. There are several options. Seasonal workers can be hired to do this work. Boulder County has a very successful prairie dog removal program and they use seasonal workers who start at $20 an hour. They have no trouble hiring people. The same seasonal workers install chicken wire barriers for the county as well as operate the county's trapping program. It's a very efficient use of seasonal staff and funds. I asked the county how long it would take them to remove prairie dogs from a 20 acre parcel with average density and the answer was probably two to three days. I believe the county's prairie dog budget is about one third of OSMP's budget and last year they treated 32,000 boroughs, built chicken wire barriers and had a successful trapping program, but they do everything themselves. Bringing removals and chicken wire barriers in house is something that OSMP needs to seriously consider. This can make the budget budget go a lot farther and allow, allow the program to be much more efficient and effective and treat more acres. The city of Boulder owns billions of dollars in water rights. Healthy irrigated pastures are one of your best tools to capture carbon as well as grow food or feed for the community. This program has been a success so far, but there is much more to go. All of these irrigated agricultural pastures are worth the investment. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. Our other individual who had signed up ahead of time does not seem to have joined us in the meeting. Um, Alan Delamere, I'm not seeing your name, but if you are here under a different name, please reach out to me in the Q&A so we can get you back in the line. Um, so now we will start with um, Mike Browning, followed by Hal Hallstein, followed by Francis Harta. So Mike, I'll enable your microphone now, and then we'll start the timer when you begin. Let's see, that didn't work. Let me try again. There we go. <laughs> you should be able to speak now, Mike. Thanks, my name is Mike Browning. I've lived at 3186 Galena Way in South Boulder for over 30 years. I have two general comments to make about the possible disposal of open space land uh, for the CU South Boulder Flood Control Project. First, several years ago, you worked hard on a resolution setting forth the conditions the city would have to meet before you would consider disposal of open space lands for the project. That resolution was adopted at your June 9, 2021 meetings. One of those conditions was that the OSBT board and the city enter into a binding agreement uh, setting forth a detailed mitigation plan uh, that would be financed and binding on the city. Uh, those mitigation, the required mitigation measures included land dedications, various baseline studies, the creation of new wetlands, or at least the, out, uh, the details up for the creation of new wetlands, the development of a monitoring program for impacts of the project on upstream and downstream wetlands, 
and the escrow of city funds to pay for the mitigation measures. However, to my knowledge, negotiations or work on such an agreement have not yet even begun. They really need to. Uh, it is essential that the negotiation of such agreement not be put off to the last minute. Hard negotiations with the city will be required and that will require a lot of time for your staff and for your for the board's own attention. Uh, you shouldn't be rushed into something at the last minute when the city does submit a formal application for disposal. Uh, you need to work out the details uh, of the conditions of disposal long before then. Some of the baseline studies that are called for in that uh, 2021 resolution, I don't believe have even been started or designed yet and will take years to complete. So it's essential that that process gets started right away and not further delayed. You don't want to be faced with a disposal request uh, at the last minute before these things have been done. So please work close with your staff to make sure that that process begins soon. Second, I wonder whether the city's obtained approval from CDOT yet for the new 30% design. A lot of time and money was wasted several years ago on a previous design only to have CDOT shoot it down. With the 30% design nearing its completion, it's uh, certainly time for the city to get a signed CDOT sign off on the proposal so that more time and money is not wasted in the plan, including your time and money. Um, so those would be my two requests that you follow up on. Uh, thank you for all your work on the CU South project and for our open space program in general. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike, and uh, thank you, Leah, for putting the uh, cam getting the camera back in the room. We appreciate that. Um, next, we have Hal Halstein, followed by Francis Herto. Excuse me for my pronunciation. Followed by Lynn Siegel. Hal, you should be able to use your microphone. Good evening, Open Space Trustees. My name is Hal Halstein. Um, I previously served on your board. And I'm here um, for open comment to discuss uh, today's matters from the department on South Boulder Creek flood mitigation. Um, as I track this project um, and the ongoing great work that the board is doing, um, a couple thoughts came to my attention that I wanted to share with you. Um, through discussions with community members, it has become clear to me that during the construction of any flood wall at South Boulder Creek, that the actual construction project and removal of soils in the flood wall area has the potential to hydrologically impact and drain the surrounding soils next to the project site. And so considering the timing of such a project in terms of when there is groundwater movement or perhaps not movement, I'm no expert in this field, um, considering the timing closely could be important to reducing impacts on adjacent ground through the fact that the water may want to leave that soil to come into what will essentially be a hole or a trench that is being dug. Um, another point that was brought to my attention, which I thought is interesting, is that um, given that the uh, the groundwater water conveyance system, which is being contemplated for this flood wall, is sort of an untested technology, that perhaps a staging of the construction project that would allow that first lowest to the ground feature of the flood wall to be tested through the important seasonal highs and lows of groundwater uh, in order to basically test what before the entire wall is on top of that structure, essentially rendering it uh, inimprovable could also be a really wise thing to consider within the timeline of this project. Um, that's all I have for you. Thank you very much uh, for your hard work on this topic. Thank you, Hal. Thank you. Apologies. Next, we will have Francis, followed by Lynn Siegel. Francis, you should be able to unmute now. Francis, can you use your microphone? It looks like you are unmuted. 
but we can't hear you. Hi, my, sorry about that. My name is Frances Hartog. I'm a 35 year Boulder resident at 3186 Galena Way and uh, like Hal, a former trustee. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, the, the board of trustees put a lot of work into the two resolutions that they passed and to have them, those resolutions, and this is regarding CU South, sorry, but to see those resolutions receive only lip service in the, the staff's um, agenda is, is really um, troubling. I would urge the trustees to stick to their guns and ensure that the conditions in those two resolutions be met before you agree to consider a disposition of the property. Um, the disposition of the property, as you know, is, is kind of the hammer you have here. And so you do need to use those tools. A lot of thought went into those two resolutions um, from a lot of uh, different areas of expertise. And I would just urge you to stick to your guns, review those resolutions. The conditions in them are important. The requests for information in them are still important. So please require staff to meet the conditions in your resolutions. Thank you, that's it. Thanks for your service. Thanks, Francis. Thank you, Francis. And we do have just one more hand up, um, which is Lynn Siegel. Before I unmute you, Lynn, I'll just encourage the rest of our attendees, if you would like to speak at this time, uh, this is your last call to get that hand raised so that we can turn to you next. So now, Linda, yes. Linda. One, one thought, I, I don't know whether you see anybody that has joined on a phone instead of online. Thanks, no, I don't see anyone okay. at this point that's joined by phone, but thank you for that, Karen. Okay, thanks. Well, it is a very different process for those folks. Um, okay, so we'll go with Lynn. Um, while Lynn is speaking, if anyone else would like to speak, please um, use that raise hand function or send me a note in the Q&A box. Lynn, you should be able to unmute now. So the taxpayers are ultimately going to pay for all of this. Um, you know, I was in the library today, the, um, uh, the meth thing in there, the, the drywall replacement, all the computers are thrown out and recycled. You know, the, the upholstery, you know, you can't anticipate these things. And guess where it comes from? The general fund for fire and police. And OSBT, I'm sure, gets funded by, if not general funds, it's something with the city. It's not the developers that are paying. And I'm fighting the developers every day. And they just got a big deal at Papilio's. They got from BC2, business, commercial, mixed use, and housing. And that increases our jobs housing imbalance, and that increases our costs, our impacts, and our funding for open space. And yet you're proposing this CU development that is, it's absolutely unthinkable, the impact of that development on our community. And the fact that CU is another city, they aren't owned by Boulder. They can do whatever they want, basically. And what one person brought up, the agreement that happened, you know, th this agreement between CU, that was basically a fast-tracked agreement. And it's the same thing now, like she said, that this, this needs to be thoroughly evaluated now rather than a quickie new agreement that's another development like that, which suddenly you've got something that you can't handle. You can't handle this CU development. You're gonna find out years from now, that was the end of Boulder as we know it, the end. This is not a big, huge city. It's just not. And we can't have these places. Don't tell CU what to do. Tell them what they can't do. And they cannot develop on CU South. They can absolutely not. And you will find this from CDOT, and you will find this from the what Hal was talking about. You know, this is common sense stuff. It's just like the city council saying, oh, we want the the 
affordable housing. We want people to be able to buy affordable housing in downtown Boulder, in the most expensive part of downtown Boulder. No, you don't need to spend a year and a half for the developer to figure out that it's not feasible. That's common sense. Just the same as CU South, it's common sense that you cannot have a huge development, a doubling of the campus, basically, in Boulder without huge, huge impacts and for flooding for other places. You think that was bad at Frazier? You watch what the future holds. Done. Thank you, Lynn. I do not see any other hands up at this time. Um, and Karen, don't know if you want to make any space for staff or the trustees to respond to any comments that they heard. But otherwise, we um, seem to be through um, our hands for public comment tonight. Thanks very much, Brenda. I appreciate your orchestrating all of that. Um, and since the, the comments were all uh, directed at items that come later on our agenda, rather than making any comments now, I'm assuming that everybody will take under advisement the public comments and integrate them into what's happening later on the agenda. Um, but thank you to all of you who participated in the public participation segment of our meeting tonight. So next on the agenda is matters from the board. Um, are there any specific questions that you want to ask regarding the public comment? Okay, um, then let's go to questions on the written information that was included in the packet for tonight. Uh, the first item was the 4th of July, management of the 4th of July uh, trailhead. And I have a area. Go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, I have a question about that. Um, I was just wondering why they decided to go with um, like it, those, those uh, the um, timed entry every single day of the week versus the weekends like State Park, Eldo State Park. Do you all know that? I don't know the specifics of, of the reason that Boulder County is, is going to that way, but I would be happy to check it in unless Janelle, you... Looks like Lisa. Oh, oh, Lisa. oh, great, Lisa's on here. Great, thank you, Lisa. Hi, good evening. Um, I, I believe it was just the, the visitation. I think they were anticipating that there was going to be a need to have it every day of the week. And so if you offset it, allow it on a Wednesday, they were thinking perhaps you would offset that use on a Saturday and Sunday. And so I think it was to provide more opportunities for people to be able to buy a permit um, to come on days when perhaps it would be less busy. And have you seen the data to, to kind of support that? Uh, it's not offered now, so um, we would be something that we could note and make sure that we track, especially in the first year. Right. Well, I know that you don't have the data because the, the um, system is not in place, but do they have the traffic data uh, to support uh, um, the recommendation? Yeah, we have vehicle counts from the weekends, but not from the weekdays. So when, when the... Um, when the stops were made. So when there was actually enforcement over the weekends between those holidays, um, we do have data. We don't have data on the weekdays. Do you think we said that over time, that would be something that you could adjust back and, and um, say, well, you know, Monday through Friday, we want to lift that? Yeah, and I think there's going to be a learning curve with everything, um, and so that's something I can definitely make note of and make sure that we have a bigger discussion around that. Okay, thanks. In the second paragraph of the memo, Lisa, it, the fourth line, it says, this trailhead sees a daily average of 200 visits, a daily average of 200 visits during non-winter months. Um, so is that only weekend visits instead of daily visits? I, I believe so, yes. And along that line, Lisa, is the number 200, is that individual visitors or what, what is that? Because further down in the memo, it says there's 76 parking 
spaces at the 4th of July trailhead. And so, you know, I guess theoretically there would be some turnover of parking. And, and so I'm, I'm wondering about the relationship between the spark, parking spaces and the visitation number. Yeah, and so there was a traffic checkpoint set up, and so that was the number of cars that would come in and out on average throughout the, when that traffic checkpoint was established. So the 204, 76 total parking spaces, um, those were vehicle counts when those traffic checkpoints were established. So is the 200 a vehicle count? Vehicle count. So it's not visitors, I think it would be more accurate to say 200 vehicles, right? Yes, yeah, I would agree. And so the visit, the visitation number might, or presumably would be higher than that. Correct, depending on visitors right. in the car, uh, right. each car, right, exactly, right. you're right. Okay, any other comments or questions? Um, I just wanna make sure I'm following it. So, and, and these checkpoints and um, this research that was done was only done on the weekends? Correct. Okay, okay. I, my sense is that the board agrees that attention to whether this needs to be a weekend reservation system or a, just or a, a seven days a week system is a question that we'd like followed and addressed. Wonderful, I'll take note. Okay. I, I or this, yeah. okay. Uh, Lisa, so uh, my other question is on the use of the uh, Netherlands High School parking lot. So that parking lot is on a completely different road than, than the access to 4th of July. So how effective is that working? And, you know, is there confusion among people about, you know, where they're going and that sort of thing? And, and how, how, how effective is that parking strategy working? We've actually found it to be remarkably successful. Um, so people understand as they come into town that there's going to be parking congestion. So the shuttle, um, I, I do have visits I can share with you as far as um, how many riders were on the shuttle, um, but they did find it to be very successful. So they're looking to continue that at the HESI trailhead. All right, the next uh, information item is about the Gerhardt Integrated Site Plan Implementation Status. Um, and as Jeff and Eileen have suggested, um, the Gephardt Integrated Site Plan is online and was paused um, for addressing the New Zealand mud snail problem. Uh, I guess I'd like to start, Jeff, um, or is Eileen here? No, she's okay. just speaking to me this evening. Okay, yep. great. Um, can we start with um, your talking a little bit about what kind of meetings there have been and with whom, um, with community members since the startup post, post New Zealand mud snail pause? Yeah, so Jeff Haley, Deputy for Trails and Facilities. Um, in fact, we haven't had any direct meetings yet with the community since this kind of restart, refresh of the project. Um, in fact, that's really the goal of this written update for the board is just to let you all know that um, we have, the project is still um, happening. We've re-initiated um, all the design and planning that was done um, back in 2020. Uh, previous to the New Zealand mud snail situation. And in fact, as I mentioned in the memo, um, we anticipate here in the next few months working with the community, the Greenbelt Meadows uh, neighborhood and others, and then providing updates to them. So to answer your quote, we haven't had any direct discussions yet. Um, that's kind of what we're gearing up to do. Great. Um, does anyone else on the board have any questions about this? 
Uh, Jeff, I have one, uh, you know, uh, social trails on the west side, certainly a, a big issue. Uh, in the discussions with the neighbors, the Greenbelt Meadow, um, are, are we making any progress on agreements or understanding of why it would be necessary not to have, uh, you know, trail access on the west side? And yeah. can I can I add to that before you start your answer? Sure. Uh, my look at the um, website, I think, shows that the west side is close to all trails north of the southern bridge, between the southern bridge and the existing northern bridge. So I guess I'd ask that in conjunction with Dave's question. Yeah. So I think the best way to answer that is you're correct. A preferred alternative that was approved or supported back in 2020 showed um, the closure or elimination of that west side undesignated trail. Um, to kind of mitigate that or replace that, there is a connection shown to occur to allow folks to go out to 55th Street. So from the Gephardt, or I'm sorry, neighborhood, um, using existing road and it will will provide access out to 55th but um and then folks that are on the east side in the neighborhood if they want to connect over to the south boulder creek trail that's where that new bridge comes in so in other words um that trail will be closed and then what was decided upon in that preferred alternative is those two opportunities to kind of get folks from the neighborhood where they can connect to other trails without using the West Side Trail. So I think Dave, to your question, uh, that'll be part of the, you know, some time has passed since all this work was done and the conversations were very recent and relevant, all that. So I think that's part of our goal is to, now we've moved from planning to implementation, to revisit the neighborhood, discuss, remind of what the alternatives were. Um, and that's the point of the memo is to share a lot of the great work that is happening with bridges and other trail connections and that sort of thing. But certainly talk about the value of the, the land and the site and why those decisions were made and that sort of thing. Great. Because I think, you know, if the neighborhood insists that it continues to need to, you know, use the West Side, um, you know, the, a trail there is then going to be, you know, uh, function the way it has, you know, historically, and that is, uh, you know, it's everyone sees the trail and assumes that it's it's okay to use it. Right. So I think it's it's uh, uh, very uh, necessary for the neighbors to understand that, um, you know, their activity uh, will go a long way to determine, you know, kind of uh, the success of the management actions on, on protected agreement. Yeah, I agree. And the maps, as I read them, have significant numbers of fencing to prevent that kind of action. Right. right? Yes, there's fencing involved, um, a variety of you know infrastructure as well as regulatory opportunities to you know ensure that the, the new trails and the designated areas are used, not the undesignated. Um, but again, with any process, you know, once you go from concept plan to implementate, there's a lot of additional design and we've done, um, in fact, a lot of our ecological staff have done additional resource survey and analysis so we can share a lot of information. Um, yeah, and a lot of time has passed since right. 2020, it was just a few years, but a lot has happened. So that's our goal is to just remind, again, that this project is is still alive, is happening, and we're hoping to move forward and share all the great work that's happening. So, yeah. okay. uh, my question is regarding New Zealand Earth. And my understanding is that the work done, for instance, at the South Mesa Trailhead um, was to keep people out of South Boulder Creek where the South Boulder, the South Mesa Trail crosses South Boulder Creek at, at, near the trailhead in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And um, that was to prevent access to the creek by 
both people and dogs, given the transference of, of New Zealand mud snails around the waterways. Um, and I'm wondering, with that policy and that action, why, with um, this stretch of South Boulder Creek, we would open up a new access to the creek? Because it seems to me we're asking for exactly what we just reversed action on at South Mesa Trailhead. Yeah, so I, um, I may need to talk with our staff a little if, if you want to. The, the one thing I can say is that um, once the new bridge is built, um, there adjacent to Greenbelt Meadows, the southern bridge, as we're calling it, from there to South Boulder Road will be closed um, with, for all access. Uh, but I believe as part of the plan, and Heather, this might be where you jump in. From there north, there will be some designated access. But if you want, yes, to it shows on the map one designated right. access point between the South Bridge and the North Bridge right. on the east side of the creek. Right. That's so my it's, question: Why would you do that? So it's not actually adding access. It's an area that currently people can access the creek. I know what it's doing is designating the access and constructing it in a way that it's more sustainable. So when New Zealand mud snails showed up in South Boulder Creek, our management prior to that had really been focused on keeping them completely out of South Boulder Creek by closing the areas that had mud snails to try and keep them from showing up. Once they were in South Boulder Creek, we really took a whole new look at, um, you know, we obviously hadn't been successful at keeping them from being moved around. And how far out of the creek are they at this point? Just a little bit um, up from the area that we're talking about. So we shifted our management to actually close areas that don't have them yet, thinking if people can't get and dogs aren't in the water, it doesn't matter where they've been they won't get into that stretch of creek. So it was, a, it was a shift in the way that we were managing for the mud snails. You know, it'll be adaptively managed and uh, there aren't a lot of good answers on how to manage New Zealand mud snails um, and how to isolate them to areas. But that stretch from what will be the new bridge downstream is currently open to creek access. And so this, this is just funneling that access to sustainable access points where we will have um, educational materials on New Zealand mud snails. And we, I mean, currently we, we ask people not to enter the water, but that if they do enter the water, here's how to mitigate the chance that you're going to take the mud snails elsewhere. So it, it's also an opportunity to focus people to where we can provide some information and education rather than just a, a broader, more open stretch of creek where it, it's hard to make sure that everybody sees that. Okay. So if, if I understand what you said, I want to repeat this. So I make sure I have it in my head correctly. We're going to revise the existing access point to make it a more sustainable access to the creek area and allow dogs and people to go in and out of the water there, um, knowing that there are New Zealand mud snails there and that they will be picked up and transmitted other places, but hopefully not further upstream. Right, and, and provide information on how people can, can yeah. prevent taking them with them when they leave. Slow the spread. Maybe or maybe not, yeah, okay. Yeah, and that, that's really a continuation of the strategies that we've had along that section of creek um, where access to the creek used to be allowed yeah. throughout the entire stretch. And we had you know a lot of banks collapsing, a lot of erosion, that yeah, kind of thing. That's so, why I'm asking, because I'm yeah. aware of the degradation of right. the banks. So it, it's, it's really a continuation. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a continuation of that. And, you know, with the New Zealand mud snails, unfortunately, there are not easy answers. And like I said, not a lot of examples of places that people have successfully either controlled them or kept them where they are. Um, so right now, we're really focused on protecting those areas where they aren't, uh, which is what was going on at South Mesa Trail. Right. And so is from South Boulder Road upstream are still closed to creek access. Yes. Okay, thanks. And that will now extend down to the new bridge. From South Boulder. From South Boulder Road yeah. downstream to the new okay. bridge that will go. Got it. Thank you. John, just for your, uh, I believe it was sometime last year or maybe uh, early last year when we finalized this management plan. And so I'm happy to provide you with 
a copy of that. It was presented to the board and we had a pretty robust conversation about the adoption of that plan. So just does, to bring you up to speed. Does anyone remember the date that we did that? Well, in 20, 2020, January 8th was when we did the final uh, preferred alternative. And I we actually linked a website in the memo. If you click on that, it'll take you to a lot of that. To, to the New Zealand Month Sale Plan? Um, that's what I'm talking about. We, we, okay. that we did that nine-month sprint to develop a management plan for all of the streams of OS on OSMP did, yeah. with regards to New Zealand mud snail. And, so, um, and we presented that to the board. And uh, I could all just follow up and let you all know when that date was if it's not linked in this particular memo. Yeah. On the web page, there's a little highlight you can click. But what, yeah, we can follow up. Sure, so you know. on this Gebhardt website, correct. There's a link to the mud snail. I believe so. We can okay. we can follow it to be sure. Basically, when we pause the project, yep. we had this information. I'm looking at it here, but uh, we can make sure if there's not a good clear link to all of it, we can get that to you. Great. And my understanding is that you're going to start with the preferred plan. Correct. That's on that Gebhardt website. That's right. Right. Okay. Any other questions, Michelle? Okay. Uh, the only two other items I made a note of under um, matters from the board is uh, I wanted to remind everybody that their calendar should now show a February 22nd OS OSBT study session. That's correct. And that's an evening meeting, right? That's an evening meeting that will be uh, concentrating on our science and climate resilience program area with a pretty heavy emphasis on, on wildfire. And we're doing that here, Dan? Uh, I'd imagine, but I guess I haven't checked in yet. I'm this room is not available that evening. I believe a different conference room might be, I think we were waiting to figure out if we were in person or virtual. Okay. And uh, we'll figure. We'll, so we'll figure out a room. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Right. And then the other uh, item or question that I had is an update from Dan about meetings in council chambers with public, both in person and virtual. Yeah, I received an email from city manager's office on the 27th of December, basically saying that right now count on status quo for the next meeting or two. Uh, and that they will provide me an update on the technology implementation that's needed for the main council chamber. So right now there's just a couple of rooms in the city that we're able to utilize for this type of meeting. And right now chambers is not available. And basically it was count on status quo for the next meeting or two. And I'll try to provide you an update on the technology implementation that chambers is going to be going through. So, so we don't have a... A firm date. Is this the meeting two or one? That was a December 27th correspondence. So this would be meeting one. So if there's any change before between this and February, I'll certainly let you we all know. You can tell that Dave is eager to we get had, Well, we had a meeting after the 27th. We yeah, had our right. January oh. meeting. So this is the second. So we may be at two meetings. True. <laughs> Not wanting to make two final points, but I, it, this is probably the second meeting since that memo. I don't, I don't, unless I'm time warped, this is our January meeting, right? This was the next meeting. This would be the next meeting I received right before New Year's. I received that right. information about. Oh, okay, I'm gonna, yeah. yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. You, have to, you actually have me convinced that it's February. <laughs> We're talking about the study session. And it's like, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> okay, with that, uh, Dan, we're ready to move to matters right. from the department and to, over to you. All right, this is the January agenda. Okay, good. And I won't say anything. <laughs> All right, so we, uh, as Karen referred to earlier, we have two items on matters from the department, both pretty uh, 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 topics of interest and uh, uh, and our, we're going to start with uh, Prairie Dog Management Program and get updates from Heather and Tori on a, a couple of different items uh, related to that. Uh, and so with that, I'm just going to turn things right over to uh, Heather Swanson, our Ecological Stewardship Senior Manager. Great. And Tori, do you want to come join me up here? Sure, I will. Um, Leah, my um, 
ability to share got taken away. Oh, I got demoted. <laughs> Brenda, do you mind adding Tori back in as a panelist? Absolutely. Sorry, I did not. It would be easier for us to see if we're both over there. That's fine. Or it doesn't matter if, if that main camera Do doesn't I, catch you. They're right. locked in, and they'll they'll turn their cameras on if that's yeah, okay. Turn the camera on when you speak, otherwise. So we can see. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, Tori, you should be able to share now, and I'll make it so that all our panelists. Can <laughs> I don't know. It just goes through. I've been having trouble in this room, so I'm assuming that's part of it. <laughs> so our apologies to everybody. <laughs> it's keeping me on my toes. <laughs> You would think we were brand new to virtual meetings. Well, that <laughs> no, just virtual meetings in this room. <laughs> Hi, I'm Heather Swanson. I'm the Ecological Stewardship Senior Manager. And I was just going to start us off with some introductory material and then turn it over to Tori to go through um, the main information that we want to talk about tonight with the public meeting and our management plans for 2023. It's, your video is on and people can see it. Uh, so, yeah, is there any way we can make the else's video smaller so we can see the full slide? I think it just, yeah, yeah, just you, slide you it over to that the right. option on there. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the right too. A it's not us, it's all thanks, Jeff. Yeah. That one should do it. Yeah, there you go. It's better. Perfect. Good work. <laughs> so I just very briefly wanted to give some background on our current prairie dog management guidance because I know several of you um, were not on the board um, for all of these processes to, to kind of know how they all fit together. So um, our first set of guidance on prairie dog management is our grassland ecosystem management plan that was approved by city council in 2010. And it really addresses um, management designations for prairie dog colonies, occupancy goals for prairie dogs, relocation criteria in the context of conservation of the whole grassland ecosystem. Then in 2018, we had a community working group, the Prairie Dog Working Group, um, that actually was 2017 and 18, but they finished their work in 2018. They put together a group of recommendations along with um, staff that came to um, the board as well as city council and were, uh, were adopted uh, by both of those groups at the time. And largely those recommendations, it's a fairly long list of recommendations uh, for prairie dog management, largely focused on conservation of prairie dogs, um, coexistence with prairie dogs, addressing neighbor concerns around prairie dogs, as well as um, education on grassland and prairie dog conservation and the importance of those um, ecosystems. And so after that process wrapped up, um, it was identified that there were some, some fairly focused conflicts going on between irrigated agricultural properties on open space with prairie dogs residing on them. So um, in 2019, we kicked off um, what at the time was called the expedited review of agricultural and prairie dog conflicts. I don't know, it took us about a year and a half. So I don't know what expedited <laughs> that is, but good. There, there was a pandemic in there. So there's, there's good reason for that. Um, and so it, it came up with what we call the preferred alternative. And the preferred alternative um, was recommended by the Open Space Board of Trustees to City Council and then approved by City Council. And what that preferred alternative did was it set up a system um, for removal of prairie dogs using a combination of lethal control and relocation from irrigated agricultural fields in what was being what is called the northern project area. And I'll show you a map of that in just a minute. Um, it also addressed what would happen after prairie dogs were removed, so restoration of irrigated agriculture and also evaluating coexistence opportunities on those irrigated fields where prairie dogs were still present. So this is um, the northern project area that was defined as part of that project. And, and this area was really defined as the focal area for this. 
um, because it at the time and still had high prairie dog occupancy levels. Um, there are a large number of irrigable properties within that boundary that also had and have prairie dogs on them. And really those, those impacts um, to existing lease areas were focused on really a few lessees. So those lessees were sort of disproportionately impacted by conflict with prairie dogs on their leased land. So that was how we got focused in on that portion of the system. So as Tori is talking, she'll talk through um, a lot of what we have done last year and upcoming this year in prairie dog removals in that northern project area. So that, that's really what we're talking about. That I will turn over to Tori. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Tori Colton. I'm the Prairie Dog Conservation and Management Ecologist. I, think I met some of you at our field trip this last spring, and the people I haven't met yet. Um, so, I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to summarize our public meeting that we had, our annual public meeting for prairie dogs in December. Um, I think it was that, it's all covered up 13 to 13. I <laughs> got that on the overhead thing and turn off the recording notification. Yeah, I think that's all I could do. That's good. That's better than what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> the goal of the public meeting um, was to update the public on prey dog management, following up on the prey dog working group, re group recommendations um, during 2022, and present our plans for 2023. The meeting was held entirely virtually, and um, presentations on uh, several management topics were recorded and made available online ahead of the meeting. So that included prairie dog management and prairie dog monitoring, as well as agricultural practices, um, soil health, and restoration actions. Uh, we took questions during the meeting and also after the meeting online up until December 20th. Um, we posted, we answered questions as we could during the meeting, and then provided follow-up information and answered the, all the questions uh, posted after the meeting online. Um, <coughs> those are posted and available online still, and then you have in your packet a list of those um, questions and comments and all the available answers. So to summarize um, briefly what was discussed in our annual meeting, um, First of all, we addressed uh, relocations for 2022. Uh, I don't know what that beeping sound is. <laughs> I don't think it's me. Um, the Humane Society of the U.S. Um, team included UHG Consulting, uh, donated roughly half the costs in their time and um, expenses for relocations from the Oasis property. That's about 40 acres of prairie dog colony, and they ended up moving about 562 prairie dogs from that property to the southern grasslands. We also removed prairie dogs using leaf control on approximately 124 acres. Um, to prevent recolonization or at least slow down recolonization, uh, we erected over uh, 24,600 feet of barriers at our relocation or removal sites where we deemed it was appropriate and needed. Um, we also did use some passive relocation for small project areas, uh, typically some trail projects where there's going to be ground disturbance or uh, when we're putting up barriers around colonies where there's uh, burrows, exactly where the barrier is going, push them out of the way so the barrier will be more effective. Restoration work happened on over 360 acres where we pray dog removals have happened since um, 2018. Um, so that we had our relo removals this year on about 164 acres, but that restoration work is 360 acres because it's addressing removal areas from previous years. Uh, we did complete plague management plan that was led by Val Matheson from the planning department. And on the um, subject of plague, we did again distribute plague vaccine in two rounds in the southern grasslands and also our relocation tape site. Still health sampling happened at removal sites, determine baseline conditions. And as part of the prey dog work group recommendations and um, just typical customer service, we had interactions with experts as well as the public about prey dog management, um, both so we could interact and learn about new prey dog management techniques from other experts and then transfer that 
knowledge to the public, get, provide whatever information we can and help them with questions or concerns. We uh, did our annual prairie dog mapping again this year in the fall that happened between September and the end of November. We documented a 16.6% uh, increase in acreage from fall 21 to 22. Um, so a pretty big increase, mapped 5,196 acres of occupied prairie dog colonies. And that's the most acreage has been mapped on OSFE property since mapping started in 1996. Um, one well, positive thing is we did document a decrease of um, prey dog occupation in conflict area areas in that northern project area. So after all removals are completed for 2022, so this just past year, we're still working on some of that because there was a lot of um, a lot of removal area to deal with. And again, those contractors were pretty busy, so it's kind of taking a protect protract amount of time. But once that's all done, uh, we'll reduce conflict acres to 668 down from 966 to 67 acres or at the start of the expedited removal process. Um, another uh, a bright point for as far as meeting management goals, the seven grasslands occupancy increased to meet our 10% occupation management goal. So that was stated in the grassland management plan, our management targets for the grassland preserves is 10 to 26 percent occupied. Um, Southern grassland preserves have not met that target. They've been below that target since 2008. So between natural expansion and then a the large part due to our relocations, we've met that goal for the Southern grasslands. Obviously, the northern eastern grassland preserves are still well over our management targets, um, but it's nice to be within the green zone for one of them. <laughs> Um, touch a little bit more on our relocations for 2022. Our main site was the Oasis site in the northern part of the system. Yeah, pointer to work, but um, that was a, we had about a 40 acre colony and the community site of the U.S. and their team, again, donated about roughly half the cost to do those relocations to the southern grasslands and they ended up moving 562 prairie dogs Trapping happened from um, roughly middle of September to the end of December. Um, the Mesa Sand and Gravel Exclusion Area is in the southern part of the system near uh, Marshall Reservoir. That exclusion area was established as part of the permitting process for the Mesa Sand and Gravel relocations to the South Strand Prairie Dog Colony that happened in 2019 and 2020. My dates are correct on that. Um, and that exclusion area was established as part of interactions with neighbors to um, help them be comfortable with us using that area as a, re as a receiving site. And our agreement was we keep prey dogs out of that exclusion area. We've had some recolonization. So we did this in-house, I did the trapping and we don't need a state permit to just relocate them on the same property. So I moved them to the other side of the barrier, caught about a dozen prey dogs that way. And then we have followed up with lethal control there. Um, so this exclusion area is a relocation site where the relocated prairie dogs have expanded into adjacent areas. Is that it's right? It's near the, the South Strand relocation site. So near, it's, but not adjacent? It became adjacent. So we didn't initially move the prairie dogs directly adjacent to that exclusion area. And it does have a metal barrier that was put up um, to protect that exclusion area. But that South Strand colony on the Mesa Santa Gravel um, area expanded a lot in the last couple of years. Yeah. And um, did, I think there are some areas, some places we can reinforce the barrier. Um, and in some cases, they climbed that chicken wire too. So, yeah, so there was. But was it a metal fence or was it a chicken wire fence? It has metal on the south side. And then on the east and north side, it has chicken wire where it's not directly facing the colony. But I think they can become, they can run around the metal part and get to the chicken wire part. Okay, so it's ex it's expansion from the South Strand relocation site to adjacent properties. Yeah, to the, to, into the exclusion area, which is yeah. technically part of the same property, which is why we didn't need to stay permanent. Got it, thank you. Yep. Our third uh, relocation site is the Ertl 
property where there is um, planned wetland restorations. And this year we had a little colony pop up right in the middle where they're planning to do major dirt work. Um, that happened pretty late in the year. We were able to get some of the team that are associated with the Humane Society group to get some traps out there just in December, early December. Um, they were able to trap and relocate four animals from there. Um, and then that, yeah, project manager Don is going to have to figure out how we can move forward. There's probably still a couple remaining on that site. Okay, so that's the uh, Boulder Creek uh, riparian restoration area. And those animals were taken where? Those were also taken to Wanaka. We got an amendment on our state permit to move them because it was just a few. And then uh, and that's kind of part of the the uh, expedited review process and including uh, some of the lethal control. We also accounted for other city projects to move small animals and relocate them as part of those efforts. So looking at our receiving site for this last year for 2022, we had to go back to Wanaka our original plan at the end of 21 was to uh, use a new receiving site, Superior West property, but that was burned over pretty much entirely by the Marshall Fire. So we wanted to give that, to give the land time to recover so that vegetation and soils would be um, stable if we, you know, as we plan to move back, look, look at that again for relocations. Um, there was some room still available at the Water Colony, so we did install 75 new artificial burrows for the 2022 relocations. Um, work began in early September, and uh, again, per the Prairie Dog Working Group recommendations, Prairie Dogs were relocated in their family groups, so the relocating team spends time observing at the take site, um, mapping coteries, the family groups are coteries, mapping how they occur in relation to each other and other coteries, and they work pretty hard to move those and keep that same kind of geography so that the Prairie Dogs are pretty familiar with their neighbors even when they move. And that helps them to stay on the property and retain on site instead of dispersing and help success of the overall relocations. They're also provided with supplemental food and acclimation cage um, for a few days after they are relocated. Um, so in talking through this map, the shaded green large area is our maximum extent. So that's the maximum, maximum area of where we've ever mapped prairie dogs at the Wanaka colony. The dark green hash area is the map area um, prior to the 2022 relocation. So that includes 21 relocated animals plus the existent colony that was there prior to relocations last year. And the purple, the two purple polygons are where we put in artificial burrows for the 22 relocations. So if I were to ask you, where at the Wanaka site prairie dogs were mapped in December, is it all of the green area or is it just the purple and the crosshatched area? The crosshatched area was the area mapped this fall. That's in 2021 or 2022? That's 2022 occupancy prior to the 2022 relocations. Okay. And in December of 2022, the occupancy at Wanaka was? We didn't map again after relocations. We didn't? No. But all the new, the 75 artificial burrows for 2022 were put in those in the purple areas. Purple polygons. Yep. Okay. So we, we can presume, I mean, it's a fair assumption that since the artificial boxes were put there, the current occupancy is the purple plus the cross edge. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. are we done with relocating at Wanaka? Yeah, there's a little bit more space in between. Yeah. Right there. yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no. I'm not five more Wanaka anymore. anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're it, done. There. It did allow us to do relocations in 22. Or yeah. In 22, because with the Marshall Fire, we would not have had, I guess, yeah. Like, yeah. But it's pretty full now, right? It's full. That button really hard. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and then we walked to the 
2023 plans as they were presented at the meeting. Um, and then kind of, then I'll talk about public feedback and then update plans that were any changes were made after the meeting. So for the plan presented at the meeting, as far as um, following up on working group recommendations and general prey dog conservation, um, we have plans to continue work on our prey dog habitat suitability model. We started work on that last year. Uh, we didn't make as much progress as we wanted due to um, staff priorities elsewhere. Um, and a lot of that related to the Marshall Fire. So it's just that was elsewhere. We didn't make a lot, of, a lot of progress. But we do have momentum going on that now. And we'll continue that into the new year. We've got a plan for um, addressing updates on that model. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Look at my chin. <laughs> um, Another uh, um, project we're going to continue working on and for 2023 is the cost sharing program. Um, we started moving that through internal review in 2022 um, and had it kind of where we thought it looked pretty good. Sent it on to the city attorney and she identified some issues um, with making it you know, function legally. So we have to come back, go back and revisit that. We'll continue work on that for 2023 and hopefully be able to release that later in the year. Um, we will continue our sylvatic plague vaccine distribution. Um, and again, we'll target the southern grasslands and plan relocation take sites. Um, we plan to uh, enter discussions about feasibility of black-footed ferret reintroduction on city land. And again, it's going to be a stepwise process, kind of internal in OSMP, and then um, continue if, if we feel like that needs to continue upward. And then we also will again have plans for our annual fall mapping of all occupied prairie dog colonies on the OSMP system. Um, worth mentioning that's only OSMP, so it doesn't include other city property that has prairie dogs. And that'll take place again in the fall, October, November timeframe. Um, 23 plans, again, presented at the December meeting for reducing conflict with irrigated agriculture in our northern project area. Um, we identified that we wanted, I wanted to relocate about 22 acres from the Brubaker Stratton property. Um, we are going to look again at the Superior Associates West property in the southern grasslands as a receiving site. Again, that was burned over in the Marshall Fire, but we saw a pretty good recovery of vegetation there. So we'll be looking at that for this upcoming year's receiving site. Um, one thing to note with our prey dog occupation in the southern grasslands, hitting that 10% target, it is stated in the grassland plan that we will discontinue relocations to the southern grasslands when we hit that 10% target. And we identified we were there um, literally a couple days before that public meeting. So since we are so far in the planning process, we're going to continue with this plan and keep it on the table. I'm um, going to start the permitting process for Superior West because it's going to be a lengthy process. Um, it's a new property that we're proposing to permit. So we're going to have to write letters to all the neighbors and make sure they don't have any major concerns that we're going to need to address or negotiate. Um, but because we have hit that 10% target, we are going to be exploring the use of other receiving sites outside of the OSMP system. Um, there are a couple options in the state. Um, where county um, commissions have agreed to let prey dogs be moved across uh, county lines. So we'll be looking at those options. Um, for removal by lethal control, uh, we're looking at 94 acres of prey dogs from the Axelson, Lore, and Ellison properties. This is in the Eastern Grassland Preserve. So it's the first time we've looked at Grassland Preserve properties for re uh, removals but these are also still irrigated agricultural lands. So they fall within that purview of the Northern Project area. Um, we'll continue our practice of installing barriers where we deem them necessary to um, pre prevent that they don't, they're not hundred percent, but we want to slow down and reduce recolonization with barriers. And then once prey dogs are removed, then we use restoration to return agricultural function to those lands. And they're continuing collection of baseline soil information prior to and after removal to document so it changes in soil conditions. 
um, maps to go along with our, that were presented in the December meeting. Um, our renewal sites include uh, the southern portion of the Baker Stratton property in the north, and those are removal areas. And then uh, portions of the Axelson property, as well as the Laura and Ellison properties. And again, these are grassland preserves, but they're also irrigated ag lands. Uh, before you leave that, sure. does the red circle up there at the top for Brubaker Stratton, does that include your additions of 6.5 acres or are those? It does not, and I'll get to that. Okay. This is just the map that was presented in the December meeting. Okay. Let me change the page. Here we go. <laughs> um, and then this is the map of the Superior West um, property in the southern grasslands directly west of Marshall Reservoir and northwest from Wanaka site. I labeled that just for context um, so you can see where it is in, in, um, in relation. And we're just going to be targeting the area in the red oval um, because that um, is best area to avoid uh, sensitive vegetation associations. And can, while you're on that map, can mm -hmm. you tell us where the, is it Giuliani? No, it's the wrong name. You mentioned Gallucci, Gallucci and the Emu. Gallucci, it's, the, it's the Gallucci property. It's to the north and it's the um, north side of Highway 36. It's not on oh, this it's map. north of 36. Yeah, it is tech, not within the grassland reserve boundary. I thought it was in South. I thought it was in Superior. It's like City on the Hill. It's an extension of Richmond's. Unless I have the wrong. I think part of it is part of there's also South part of okay. So I think there's part of this grassland preserve. It'd be divided by Highway 36. Okay. So could you show us, Heather, where you think they're talking? The, Superior landowners are talking about. I can't on this map. Okay. Af after that, I can work on pulling up maps and we can. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank I'm you. Sure pull up something to share that. Um, and just as a note, so the relocation plans would um, add about 1% of occupied area to the southern grassland preserves. So if there was no other expansion except for relocations, it would increase southern grassland um, occupation from 10 to 11 percent. So a quick summary of public feedback. And again, you have the full list of questions, comments, and our answers in your packet. Um, general public concerns and comments um, or concerns about prey dogs moving on to private property and impacts of private property, as well as impacts to OSMP lands. Um, there is some um, concerns expressed about the influence of the nesting eagles on prey dog management at Broodbreaker and Stratton, but also concern about general use of, use of lethal control on OSMP lands. Um, we did receive comments related to the benefit of using Delta dust to manage plague in prairie dog colonies. There is support for continuing implementation of working group recommendations um, and requests for updates to the grassland management plan and to include reduction of lethal control and increase implementation of prairie dog working group recommendations. In response to some of that feedback, um, after the public meeting, uh, we decided to include an additional eight and a half acres on the Stratton side of the Brubaker Stratton property for removal. Um, that is going to require moving some funds around so that there's additional funds available for more barriers. Um, we also had stated that we plan to do relocations from the Brubaker Stratton property and lethal removal from Axelson. Um, we decided to switch that around and use, plan to use lethal control on Brubaker Stratton since that would uh, allow a shorter timeline and better enable us to avoid disturbance of the nesting golden eagles that are north of that property. And then we'll use relocation on the southeastern portion of the Axelson property. It's about 27 acres. And um, there we think we can better manage Delta dust application 
to avoid runoff to any water bodies in the area. Um, and we also are going to begin a comprehensive evaluation of limitations and opportunities related to irrigation, um, infrastructure for irrigation, and restoration on the remaining irrigated properties with prey dog conflicts in that northern project area and start identifying resources um, to address those needs. So here's an updated map of our um, planned removals. And so the blue areas pointed to that part on the Stratton property on the Blue Breaker Stratton complex, eight and a half acres we're adding. And that's gonna be lethal control used up there. Um, where and where does the eagle circle fall? I have a map later in the presentation that shows that. I mean, yeah. That's okay. We'll it's see it later. Generally, no, I do have my point generally the, the acres that have been added are within a half mile of yes. So the half they mile buffer. Regulatory buffers have been asked. I can show a map, but my pointer is kind of describing where the half mile buffer for the eagle nest is. And it's the quarter mile buffer is well outside of our removal area. Right. And the, the reason why you went north there instead of to the west to get the, the red blob on the western edge. And we can, Andy Pelster is, is also here, so he can answer some of those questions. Okay. But that has to do with the feasibility of agricultural restoration. Uh, the water on that parcel is a real issue. Right. Okay. Oh, my pointer showed up and now it's not. Oh, there it is, sort of. Um, and then our plan, so now the plan for relocations is on the southern area of the Axelson property. We'll do relocations here, um, lethal removal here. And this part of the Axelson property, this transition area is outside of the grass observed boundary. And we did lethal control there for 2022. So that's already been completed. That's, yep, that's already been done. Nice. So it's contiguous moving on. Yeah. yeah. Good. I think this is back to you, Heather. So um, what Tori's presented to you is, is sort of our, um, is very similar to what we presented to you last year as far as what we did the year previous, what we're going to do in the upcoming year. What we found um, as we go through the, what will be three years of this process um, since we defined the Northern Project area and came up with the preferred alternative for dealing with conflict between agriculture and prairie dogs is that, you know, we have a lot of lessons learned. Um, we've learned a lot of what has worked well, what hasn't worked well, as we look forward to future properties for management. Um, we have properties with sort of more things going on with them, um, or they may be discontinuous to other properties where removals have been done. So, in 2023, um, we are planning to look back over the program, see how it's doing, evaluate what's gone well, what lessons have we learned, um, and basically determine how to best focus our efforts um, to have the largest impact in upcoming years um, on reducing that conflict between agriculture and prairie dogs. Um, some things on the ground have changed. Tori mentioned the nesting eagles. They weren't present when we went through that process looking at the northern project area. Um, and so it's it's a good time to kind of look back and um, evaluate things before we come up with our plans for 2024 and beyond. Um, so some of the things that we're going to be uh, considering are um, some agricultural factors. So um, what do the impacts look like to those lessees in the northern project area that we talked a lot about when we came up with the preferred alternative? You know, how much reduction has there actually been for each lessee in their um, lease area? How much improvement has there been on the agricultural production within their lease areas? Um, are there sites that have challenges for agricultural restoration? You just mentioned one, Karen, that southern side of um, the Stratton property. So areas where we may have insufficient water or a lack of intact water infrastructure, what can be done to address those issues? Um, what have we learned from restoration of other sites? What, what have we found that works well and what may not have worked as well? And how can we apply that to upcoming sites? Um, and then also to consider high value irrigated areas outside of the project area. And what are our plans for those? Certainly our irrigated agricultural fields are not um, restricted to the Northern project area. 
Um, looking at some ecological factors within, um, especially the northern project area. So looking at wildlife use of irrigated agricultural land, both with prairie dogs currently there and where prairie dogs have been removed. Again, we've mentioned the golden eagle nest adjacent to Brubaker. Um, we've also had recent evidence of um, ongoing badger use of areas north of Boulder Reservoir, some of them um, within 2022 removal areas and some within the areas that are proposed for 2023 removal, as well as on adjacent parks and rec properties. Um, and we've really um, learned where some concentrated raptor foraging areas are um, as, as we've spent more time in this portion of the system doing um, both prairie dog work as well as the follow-up restoration and um, agricultural work. Um, looking at our barrier installation, which designs work, how are we designing them to make sure that we're not um, making major barriers to other wildlife trying to move across the landscape? And then how to minimize the impacts of relocation techniques in native grassland receiving sites. If we don't relocate into southern grasslands this year or in future years, this may be learning that we apply at some point in the future, but certainly um, we have adapted each year to try to minimize the impacts of relocation. Um, to those native grasslands. And so looking at, again, what's worked, what hasn't worked, what other things might be worth trying. And then other factors, um, looking at that landscape context and the impact on the exclusion success. Karen, you mentioned that the 23 removal sites are adjacent to the 22 removal sites. That's certainly by design and makes it easier to exclude prairie dogs from those areas. Um, we do have some properties that, that don't sit on the landscape in that way. And so looking at what the landscape context is and what that means for our ability to keep prairie dogs out of those properties after exclusion. Um, what the maintenance needs are moving forward. We certainly have found that although recolonization is, is not high, there is some. So there is follow-up removal required in, up in future years. And as barriers age, there will obviously be maintenance needs with those. We want to be sure that that's captured and factored into our plans going forward. And then looking at the future availability of receiving sites for relocation. Um, the, the grassland preserve occupancy levels have sort of changed the, the landscape, if you want. Um, in that respect, we, we've got some other areas on open space that we're certainly looking at at, at PCAs um, and areas off of open space, but the this PCA. Uh, prairie dog conservation areas. And th those are areas that um, are designated to be receiving sites. We do have a couple that are at low occupation. Those tend to have higher challenges, though, of neighboring landowners. Um, and, and kind of difficult landscape context challenges. So those are a little bit more challenging to permit than the grassland preserves, but we certainly will be looking at those in future years. So we, we just want to kind of look back at, at what we think is going to happen in the future years with, with it being less straightforward to identify receiving sites. So our next steps is that we will, as I said, evaluate the lessons learned through you know, three plus years of management. We were doing prairie dive removals in this area prior to 2020. So we actually have um, about five years of, of learning um, of removals in these areas. Um, looking at the conditions on all of the remaining agricultural property properties in the project area, we're down to a small enough number of properties that now it's really time to dig into each of those to make sure that our plans are as tailored as possible for the best um, chance of success. So looking at what restoration needs are, what infrastructure or water needs might be, be, um, what barriers look like, what the ongoing maintenance will be, and what the ecological conditions on those are. And then, as I said, also to look at other prairie dog and agricultural conflict areas across the system to figure out what our plan is in those areas. And so really the outcome of that will be to, de to determine where and how to best focus our resources after 2023 to have the largest impact on reducing conflict between prairie dogs and irrigated agriculture. And then come up with strategies to minimize the impacts to native grasslands as well as some of those sensitive wildlife species that I mentioned. So uh, this is a project that I think um, we're going to be undertaking in the coming months as staff. And I, I think certainly we'll be interested in coming back and talking to the board about that, presenting what you found and um, you know, getting, getting your thoughts on um, sort of our future year plans as well as my book. So that's all that we have as far as presentation. We're certainly happy to answer questions. As I said, Andy Pulster is also virtually on the meeting. So he's available to answer questions. Um, and Karen, if you don't mind, I might circle back to Gallucci first off, just okay. because that was something that, tell us what this orange flower is. I was just about to say that. I was going to look it up. And, <laughs> <laughs> and 
yeah. someone's gonna ask. It's I know I've been told and I forgot. <laughs> it looks like a tulip rather than a native. It is a four-parted, so it could be some sort of poppy. I don't know what kind of poppy. Believe it was one. some sort of poppy. <laughs> Or a primrose. Maybe someone online knows. Yeah. <laughs> later. Yeah, no, is Lynn on the call? <laughs> Put it in the chat if you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 If anybody's got one of those ID apps on their phone, they can hold it up to the. Yeah. <laughs> so just circling back to Gallucci, um, Tori is right. Gallucci does lie fully north of US 36. The colony on the south is City on the Hill. Um, not the Bucci. Can we so show a map while we're saying this? Do we have a six to point? I'm sorry to. Let me look for Brandon. I mean, open data is working for the map at least. <laughs> oh, there's two in the chat box now. I bet our answer's in there. It's Brenda's noticing. How many of you know? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I love that. Let's see if I need. You'll get an extra cookie. Like Brian, coffee. Brian looks like coffee. coffee. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Thank you, Brian. A native or an invasive? Oh, Brian. Yeah, it looks like a <laughs> Not Great. even the Latin name. Stop sharing. Oh, Brian. And then oh, Brian. <laughs> Slip it. Yeah. <laughs> you guys online have all sorts of resources in your fingers. Google. Yes, I know. And all, all of our maps are either northern project area or southern part of the system. So, um, but this is a system wide map. So there's my arrow moving around. Is that going to be up there somewhere? Horn puppy? Yellow horn <laughs> it's a multiple objective area and on the north side of highway 36 and we have we have open space now parks property on that north side of 36. Mm -hmm. yeah that's the overlook area Oh, okay. And to the yeah, east yeah. is is it Louisville open space, and then but as you head west, it's it's the city. Of okay. Louisville. So that's nowhere near the the west superior area. No, the superior west area. It's right there. Where no, where your hand? Yep. Is. Yep. There. And then can you move the hand back to so I can see it? To the Lucci? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. It's right there. There. Okay. So. so that is adjacent to one of the Telegrass Prairie colonies. Colony or the the uh, Lucci is or yes. Yes. And do the prairie dogs go back and forth over 36? I don't think very successful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure some occasionally do, but no, I, I don't think that there's a lot of movement there. That would be a pretty good barrier. Track north of 36. Oh, yes, there is. Right. So that's my concern. That we might as well get into it. Um, as far as uh, preservation and uh, restoration of high quality native grasslands. And, West Superior, ironically enough, you know, kind, kind of uh, is a good example. I'm, I think uh, before the Marshall Fire, it was in pretty good shape, uh, quality wise. And I'm very concerned that we've only had one growing season since the Marshall Fire uh, for that area to come back. And the rule of thumb is usually three to five years before you know grassland is fully established and so i'm very concerned for two reasons about west superior one is that historically it's been pretty high quality grassland and more recently now it's it's you know had a wildfire which actually is good for it ironically enough but i'm concerned that we're prematurely targeting it for prairie dog uh uh, occupation yeah, relocation and so my larger issue and, and this is the southern grassland uh, conversation in general is that uh, i'm really concerned about us putting all these prairie dogs in what i think are some of the highest quality grasslands on the system and so when we're looking at alternative sites here's my other question um 
I am wondering if you have an idea about those options and you know where they are and kind of what the conditions are that uh, would make them you know relatively acceptable. So yes, I, and there's definitely several things there. First of all, I, I would say that with southern grasslands at 10% occupancy, if we see those occupancy levels continue. Um, southern grasslands will not be a can, will not continue to be a receiving site for right. so longer term unless we see play move back through um, we won't be looking for additional sites there uh, superior west is still in the mix because it was supposed to be a receiving site in 2021 it also is one of the few that meets our vegetation criteria and also is um, accessible enough and some of the other things that we need for receiving sites. So um, we are getting to a point, even if we weren't at 10% occupancy, that um, receiving sites that can be feasibly used for relocation based on the relocation criteria, as well as just the logistical needs for a receiving site, um, were, were pretty well used up. And so um, what happens with that is if we don't have a receiving site and we can't find one elsewhere or we can't get a permit for one elsewhere, then we're faced with not being able to do relocation. Right. And that, that may be a future that we're looking at and those are conversations that we definitely need to have, what, what happens in that situation. Um, we were trying to avoid having to have that conversation for at least one more year um, with Superior West. The other sites that we would be yeah, sure. uh, comment again on Superior West. So um, you mentioned that, uh, you know, our data show that, you know, it's a relatively good condition, but all those data were pre-fire, right? Yes. The and so I'm concerned again that we may not have a very good handle on the condition. conditions currently or kind of in the near future. So I would say that the official data collection was pre-fire. However, um, Lynn Riedel, Megan Bowes, and Ann Lesberg all spent time on the site to see if they felt the conditions were substantially different from when they did the measurement pre-fire. And they, they felt that the vegetation looked uh, sufficiently robust to still meet those qualifications. Because of the timing of the Marshall Fire, we didn't have time to fully repeat the transect monitoring that we had. Right. Um, so it was a um, faster evaluation than is, is typically done. Um, but their opinion on the ground was that the vegetation looked sufficiently recovered to still meet those criteria. That's not necessarily the entire property either, the entire colony, it's not a whole property. Um, you know, within that colony, there's a there's a pretty big diversity of plant communities, some of which are, are things like xeric tall grass and um, needle and thread communities that are pretty sensitive. Those are not the portions of the, of the colony that we would look at um, to put relocated prairie dogs. We were really focusing on the mixed grass prairie, um, the area that was, was somewhat lower quality pre-fire, but still sufficiently robust to support prairie dogs. So um, the conditions across the site may not be consistent everywhere, but within the areas that we were looking to actually put relocated animals, they felt that it should still um, meet the, the thresholds for, for relocation. So if the record can reflect, uh, at least I have, uh, and I appreciate that, Anna, your response and everything, but I still uh, have pretty large reservations about that area specifically and kind of are looking at uh, what I consider to be relatively high quality grasslands kind of throughout the system. And that's why I think it's really important to identify if there are other alternative options and uh, where those might be. Because the other thing in, in looking at the bar graphs that were included in the memo, the prairie dog population or occupancy is is trending upward and plague, you know, from the bar graphs have, has been the primary management tool uh, to control the prairie dog numbers and, and you know locations and colonies. And I th so here's the irony in my mind. So we're giving prairie dog colonies vac vaccines to prevent plague. 
we're seeing that trend line continue and it historically has been what 10 to 12 to 15 year cycles of you know of plague uh, you know depredation if you will but we're not seeing that currently and what we see is that trend line continuing to go up and so i'm really concerned that uh we're losing I wouldn't call it the battle, but we're losing ground uh, because the populate the numbers are increasing. You know, the areas that are occupied are increasing, and we're we're kind of struggling to you know keep keep up. And without play, uh, I I don't think we're going to be able to keep up. And so that's my concern, and why I think if we've got alternative sites. You know, now is the time to really start focusing on those because I think for the open space system, we're pretty much done, uh, except possibly for a few, you know, smaller exceptions. Um, I don't see big areas. You mean done with re with relocating re -relocate. into the southern grasslands? Right. Well, yeah, in, into other, you know, large grassland areas. Which means southern grasslands, Which right? Which mean. <laughs> just want to clarify. I mean, our main goal this year is to identify an alternate receiving site. If we can't, we will need to then decide what our plan for 23 is, okay. given the occupancy of southern grasslands. We're going to start the process of permitting because if we decided in you know, June or July, yeah, we do want to go ahead and use it. It would be too late to initiate that process. So we'll start that process in the hope that we never need to get that permit because we have an alternate receiving site that we've identified. So what are the other sites that you're thinking in your mind when you say other receiving sites? Because both of you have used that phrase. So where are they? Well, so there's one down in Pueblo County. Um, there's a, a couple of spots in Jefferson County. Um, and they're ones that have have received prairie dogs from other counties in the past. So we're we're reaching out to their is the arsenal one. It is not. Okay. No, I, I don't know that they have received prairie dogs from elsewhere, unless that's uh, new. I think they're struggling with playing out there too, so it yeah. wouldn't be appropriate for us to be in there. And Rocky Flats. Um, Rocky Flats has been accepting prairie dogs. We certainly yes. will be talking with them. The wildlife refuge. Right. Can you guys talk to me oh, just um, a little bit about the state permitting? Are we getting the same? Are we getting the permits at the same time annually? Do we have to do, if application's the right word, an entirely new application yearly? Or is a lot of it able to piggyback off the year before? Um, I just want to know a little bit more about permitting. Yeah, so at Wanaka, we're able to piggyback off of previous years. I think a full permitting effort went through in 2015, 2017, somewhere in there. In 2018, we had okay. a new one. Um, and so that does require going through the whole permit process, and that includes writing letters to all neighbors. And um, they need to not express any um, reservations um, or complaints about that. So that's, we talked about the exclusionary for Mason Sand and Gravel and that permit process went through. Um, Franco had concerns about prairie dogs moving around the, the reservoir and um, damaging the dam. So as part of, in, in order to get them to not have a negative letter, um, Open Space had to negotiate this, that exclusion area to great expense, um, but allowed a successful relocation site. Um, so we'll have to go through that full process with Superior West because that has not been permitted before. And who or what agency, um, if that's the right word, is approving the permits, whether it's a piggyback one or an entirely? Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Okay, thank you all. And since you keep saying start the process of permitting, why would you not instead of starting with Superior West, why would you not start with the wildlife refuge? We're gonna be doing things simultaneously um, because if we wait on the permitting for Superior West, that will no longer be an option for this year. Um, so we're doing things in parallel 
And then as soon as we have enough information to know whether there are alternate receiving sites off of OSMP, um, you know, we, we might stop that process at some point if it's, if it's no longer necessary. My understanding is that with down in Pueblo, they've kind of done the work on the receiving site end, so we wouldn't, I don't think we'd have to be doing labor letters. Right, to my understanding. Right. So yeah, I, I think other sites would be a more, uh, a quicker process, I guess. Than getting but if you start, for instance, in January with a Pueblo site and Superior West site, they would both move forward through the spring. Right. So each receiving site needs its own permit, yep. permit process. And, and the neighborhood letters are a big um, part of the approval process. Is there another component to it that... Um, That's the big one. one. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of other components as far as habitat suitability, our management plans and how this fits into those. Those haven't been hurdles for us in the past because um, we've drawn so much existing data, right? Right. We, we've got so much information. We've it's in a large framework of management plans, and our um, the habitats that we're looking at are far less marginal than a lot of places that we're going to input. So um, those have not in the past been the issue. Uh, I, I would say that the timing for when we're going to know more and the timing for when we would want to come back and talk to you about some lessons learned, it seems to like that's going to align. So I think our expectation is, is when we come back to the board to report on the whole program and what we think we're learning, at that same time, we'll probably be able to report back of what we're learning about the receiving site. Mm -hmm. And we can get your feedback at that time, too. So in my mind, the issues... I have some slightly different questions about Superior West, and they have to do with, with, the, uh, with the occupancy in all of these different prairie dog colonies in the southern grasslands. Can you bring up that map since none of us that I've talked, nobody that I've talked to has been able to do that on their home? Well, that's a good, that's a, I forgot, that is a good point. We can't. We haven't been able to access that system-wide map on the system. So we want to see it. I understand that. <laughs> We've been working with, um, so that open data catalog is not managed internal to OSMP. Oh. So our RIS staff have been working on that. We weren't aware of it until Karen let us know yesterday afternoon. And so it's it down some, to some members of the public who say, I can't see anything. And I say, I it know. It should be up and running now. You should be able to see the map and you should be able to access the data table. Um, but that- But that you can show it to us now? Yes. Well, not that that not the same data on the data portal. We don't- That's what I want to see. I don't, you could show, I mean, we could show you the table if you'd like to see it. She's pulled it out so that- Can I see the map? By colony. Yes. I am not connected to the meeting. So um, you just go online and go okay. the data portal. <laughs> I mean, I have it up on my computer. I'm just not currently in the meeting, and I think that would. And then prep with some of your questions that you had you, that you emailed. I mean, I had some bar graphs that are pretty much prepared already, so that shows just overall acres for some of these. Um, yeah, I want to see. I want to see uh, the maps because my concern is when I go out there and take a look at all of those prairie dog towns in the southern grasslands. It looks to me like they're all expanding. Like the occupied area for each of those green blocks is expanding. Mm -hmm. And I want to see if that's the case. So that will not be something that you can see tonight on the open data portal. The, the time sequence on the map, they were not able to get working today. Oh. So the Band-Aid was just a single current time frame map. So that people could at least see that and then access the, the yearly data behind it. Hopefully that will be back up and running. Okay, um, so could you pull up the map and then we can look at that. the data for each of the spots on the map? And I would say, you know, we're in a growth phase system-wide. So I, I think that your You're observations- talking about prairie dogs. Yeah, your, your observations are probably right. Growth tends to be higher in areas at lower population levels than it is in areas with with higher population levels. Um, so after plague up north, 
we saw similar growth to what we're seeing in the southern grasslands now, although actually in a far more rapid fashion than what we're seeing in the southern grasslands. Um, so the blue is occupied areas? Yeah, and I think this is each year's polygon overlaid on each other. So here's Monica. Yep. Um, and I think if you click on that, we can get a table or we get this little window that has year and acres. 2003, I guess. Um, and then I can. So the particular polygon that she clicked on is 2003. Yeah. Oh, a sub unit. So, yeah, it's kind of hard. So you can scroll through that on that little window and get subsequent years, but just for that place that I clicked. Well, let me move that. So, so typically there's a slider bar that yeah. you can slide, and that that year's data pops up. So you can actually watch yeah, the time series. for the years. Right. So you can actually watch the time series visually on the map. Grow or decrease. In, in their kind of band-aid fix to this, they weren't able to get that functional, is my understanding. Yeah. That'd be really nice. Yeah, it would see. be great. Yeah, it's a cool way to visualize the data because just plucking polygons on top of each other just gets really Okay, so go back easy. out to show the southern grasslands. That's great. Don't go, don't go further because yeah. you're getting into the northern tier. There you go. Okay. So that shows. This is functionally max extent. So this is every polygon mapped kind of sandwiched. So oh, it does talk to each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when I look at Superior West, I say to myself, that may not be the current occupancy. Correct. Right. It's definitely not. So um, Tori does have so a, this isn't going to do. Tori does have the graphs though. You can't see it spatially, but you can see the change year by year in acres occupied. So are those on the web? Or can we? Actually... She just created those for tonight. Okay. In response to Karen's question. Okay. So where's the exclusion zone on this map? It's kind of, uh, it's kind of confusing because the little things are all popping up, but it's. It's in this area. It's the sand and gravel is right. on this side of the reservoir. Yep. So it is an area that prairie dogs used to inhabit. I say, so it is at Salt Strand. It's it's within the max extent of that colony, but not an area that was occupied yeah. recently. And huh. The little area to the south of that sand strand or whatever it's called colony, is that a new colony or is that an archaic historic this colony? Is far East colony, it hasn't been active for a number of years. I'm not sure if I played out in the time period yeah. and it hasn't been active since. Um, and that was, that was actually one that we did look at as a potential receiving site. The problem is it's in very close proximity to the bald eagle nest. Um, and it, it's very small. So the effort to go through relocating into just a few acre site is probably not. Kelly has weed concerns there too. Okay, and the one south of Superior West on the, at the edge of the map, down, 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 down. Oh, yeah, that's Mayhofer. And that's an existing colony. And that is where we had, well, for the, I don't know how many years in succession, we regularly have growing owls there. And that was our one successful burrowing owl nest this year. So we wouldn't do relocations there because of disturbance to owls. And this, is that where the badgers used to be? Um, the last observation in Southern grasslands that I'm aware of was about 2005, 2006. Um, and it was downhill of there, but not too far from that colony. And that, that was pre-plague in the southern grasslands. So most of these colonies were at that max extent that you see on the map. Okay, and, and if we were just try to see Superior West current map extent. I can, I'll pop out of here and pull up that map. Oh, there we go. <laughs> don't let him, don't let him. 
Um, and Dave, while she's doing that, you had a second part to your question that we didn't get to, which is where other receiving sites are. We talked about ones off of OSMP. Other ones on OSMP, given the current occupation levels, we would only relocate into grassland preserves or prairie dog conservation areas if they met the criteria. Currently, the other two grassland preserves are, you know, at very high occupation. So we would be looking at those unless conditions change. So it would be prairie dog conservation areas. There are a couple of those at fairly low occupancy. And those prairie dog conservation areas were designated that way because they were relatively low quality areas where we, we didn't have high quality vegetation, we didn't have agriculture, we didn't have other values that we were managing for that could be in conflict with prairie dogs. So those, those tend to be areas that were occupied for a long time by prairie dogs. Some of them had soil disturbance or topsoil removal in the past. Um, so none of them are really intact native grassland. Are they two, two of them, right? Or there are there are two of them currently that are at occupation. Are they tier or no, they're not. Southern tier. No. And where are they? Uh, the first one is the Ute property, which is where our annex office is. Oh, okay. Up by Valmont Reservoir. Yeah. Those populations have recovered quite a bit in the last couple of years, so you have to look closely at whether that was still feasible. And the other one is the Marshall property north of South Boulder. North of South Boulder Road. East of Cherryville. Okay. And that, that one is still a potential? That one is still a potential. Those are ones that we've done evaluation of. They have... Um, Again, they're obviously fairly fragmented, which means they're surrounded on all sides by private land. So the, the permitting there and the outreach to the neighbors is something that we want to do um, very intentionally and um, you know, work with the neighbors to, to look for solutions that, that might make it a viable receiving site. Um, so the timeline on those is probably longer than it would be for what we've experienced in the Southern grasslands because we really want to make sure that we were working in collaboration with the neighbors rather than um, just kind of sending out a letter and you know, seeing where things went. Is that property currently grazed? No. There, there is horse grazing on a conservation easement yes, on the southern portion of that, but the fee property. Um, kind of a course, zoomed in on course scale maps. We don't have some of the details, but. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I had a couple of questions unrelated to the map. Uh, well, I, I want to finish with okay. Superior West okay. before we leave this. I want to get a handle on, on current occupancy on Superior West, historic occupancy on Superior West, and where the rare plant communities are. Okay, I don't have a map of the, of the rare plant communities. Um, and that mapping has just been updated, and they're still working through something about making it available um, to the rest of OSMP staff. So Lynn is working with our RIS group, and we'll certainly be incorporating that before we do anything. Um, but the plan is we'll definitely identify all areas of sensitive plant species and associations, and then we won't be wouldn't install any burrows in those areas. And in general, it's. Um, it's kind of the mesa top area that yeah. has the xeric tall grass, and then yeah. there are patches of needle and thread largely on the slopes. We'd be looking at the, the lower areas that are mixed grass prairie within there. So we don't have that spatially displayed um, to show you, but in general, it would be sort of the is it the southern portion of the site that we'd be looking at? Yeah. So, we're playing so the map, more in the north. I've got my hand in the area we'd be looking for relocation is this part. And this is where it's kind of hillier uh, and sloping down toward the creek. Kevin talks about the mesa part. It kind of goes up to a high rise and then flattens out in this northwestern corner. And uh, we would not be looking at any relocations there. There is a um, colony starting to expand in the far northwest corner. It's about two acres right now. And that's coming from um, this private land here. There's some prairie dogs up there. And they're just coming across that fence line. So they are moving onto the property already. Um, and we had maps max extent earlier, but it was, it did include this upper Mesa area and the lower hill slope. 
part here. Yeah, and it's important to remember that for receiving sites, we're only looking within the footprint of where prairie dogs have previously been. So there are impacts associated with the techniques used for relocation, but prairie dog occupancy would not be something new for that area. They have, they have been there previously. I understand that. However, on both the Wanaka site that you showed the map of earlier, <clears throat> they're spreading beyond the historic footprint. And in the, in the prairie dog colony to the left of Highway 93, right at the edge of that map, you can just in that prairie dog colony, you can see that those prairie dogs are spreading well beyond the his, historic, yeah, right there, well beyond the historic parameters of that colony because they are eating large areas of big blue stem that are big blue stem mats that have been grazed down to nothing. And that can't happen without it being expansion beyond historic. Well, I prairie dog would push back on that because this the um, no no the, no no the one, one down here lower left hand corner oh the west that that one. Flat yeah. Vista? yep yeah I don't know what that's extent. And so my concern my concern about any introduction, given the the large occupancy expansion phase that the populations of prairie dogs on our lands are in now is that if prairie dogs are relocated to a site like Superior West, where we have some vegetation that we are not interested in having much down, um, that the prairie dogs may very well move in that direction because they don't know, they can't read the signs and maps. So I think, you know, on the specific re receiving, we'll have another opportunity to discuss that if it looks like we might be moving in that direction. I think there's a, some possibility that we, we won't be. As far as prairie dogs that are already out at Southern grasslands, um, certainly there are trade-offs between conservation of non-prairie dog communities with conservation of prairie dogs. Sure. Um, always have been. And, you know, the grassland plan was our attempt to balance those. And we're, we're at a good occupancy level for that at right. 10%. And, you know, prairie dogs are an important component of the native grasslands um, that support a wide variety of species that we don't have out there otherwise. So, you know, I think moving forward in southern grasslands, we're largely going to be looking at the prairie dog populations that are there and what they do. And that's um, certainly interesting and sometimes challenging um, in a lot of cases, not something that we're directly managing. Um, certainly for the re relocations, those are intentional things that we are doing that have direct impacts. And so I think, I think it is important to look at those as we move forward. I think that we do have a commitment to the community at this point, based on city council's direction, to be including relocation in our removal plans. So if we um, do not have another receiving site, I think we need to have that conversation about what, what happens then. Um, but I think it, you know, it, it, it's something that, that takes more conversation than we need to have tonight. Okay, last question about the Southern grassland colonies. The other one that appears to have expanded um, occupation, largely is right north of Marshall Road. And I don't quite see that on this. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yep, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's, that's the kind of result that could happen if we start introducing in Superior West. And, and I, I think it's, I think it's a, a testimony to how successful these relocations have been, that they've not only established, but they've expanded tremendously. So that's at the root of my concern about Superior West. And I just wanna double check, of all the maps that we've seen tonight, all the maps that we've seen are after the October, November annual fall mapping, or did we see maps that 
are before the October, November annual fall mapping. Um, maps I've shown either represent mapping from fall of 22, or in some cases, I've been showing max extent, which is everything that's ever been mapped all pancaked on top of each other. Okay, John, it's all yours. <laughs> So I'm, I'm new to Prairie Dog, so forgive my ignorance. I imagine there's a really good reason, but I was surprised to hear that you were giving Prairie Dogs, you know, plague vaccine when that's kind of a natural population control mechanism. Uh, I, was, I was curious what their reason was for that. Maybe I missed it in the packet. Um, yeah. yeah, we didn't discuss the plague management plan in the packet. Uh, that was uh, part of the Prairie Dog Working Group recommendations to create a plague management plan. Um, and I don't know, I mean, Dan, that may be something that we want to put together a written item on. I'd be happy to do that since that's finalized at this point so that the board's familiar with you know, it. We provided a copy to the board um, previously, and we could also include it when we come back this spring. Mm -hmm. We could uh, provide just a, a quick overview of that and its relationship to vaccines and mm -hmm. how, we, how we utilize it. And the reasons for that are, um, I think, concerns um, with community members that are, are really um, focused on prey dog conservation, that having um, widespread plague risks losing prairie dogs on open space right. and not, not being able to maintain them at sufficient levels. Um, it, it's also an intention to um, have some control over the going from high populations to almost zero and then building our way back up and going almost to zero and hoping to uh, maintain enough prairie dogs on the landscape that we can meet our minimum conservation goals, even in the face of prairie dogs or of plague. And, and that's really how it's designed is not to, not to keep plague out of all prairie dogs everywhere, but to keep enough prairie dogs on the landscape to meet our minimum conservation goals if plague moves through the system. Perfect. So that, 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 so that we sense. don't have these extreme swings. Exactly. Yeah. So, so we're only, you know, vaccinating small amounts. Of yes. Dogs. Yeah. How so many acres we this year? Uh, 275 acres on set just in the southern grasslands and our take site. So there are relocated prey dogs also are protected. But I underpin this, a lot of the reason why plague is so devastating to prey dogs is it's not native to North America. Um, it's only been in North American continent for not even 200 years. So, uh, so that's why it really just moves like wildfire through prey dog colonies because there's not, there's not a, you know, adapted any sort of resistance to, to play. Awesome, thank you. I love talking about prairie dogs. I always learn something new every time we do. Uh, the other one I had was I saw you- And vaccine. <laughs> and vaccine. Uh, what is Delta dust? Uh, it sounds very scary. I'm sure it's not, but. <laughs> It's, a, it's an insecticide. It's used by prey dog managers um, to kill the fleas that transmit plague. Um, it's a heavily relied upon tool where there are uh, black-footed ferret reintroductions. Um, ferrets also are very susceptible to plague. And then also, A, because they get sick from it, and B, because then all their food goes away. So um, it's a really important tool for managers who have ferrets on the landscape. Um, it's also a very broad effect, broadly affecting insecticide. So when we put it on the landscape, we're being very careful um, because we know it doesn't just kill fleas. Um, and it also has uh, serious impacts to aquatic vertebrates and invertebrates. So another really important part of application and use is making sure it doesn't get into any water bodies. And the only places that we're using it is where we're removing prairie dogs for relocation because it's required by the state to try to keep plague from being moved to a new site in the process of the relocation. And your switch from, uh, what was it, from Brubaker to Axelson, I, I think was a really smart strategic move because of all that. And that, that's really, really credit to, to your... Andy, who understands the drainage on those properties yeah. and how much control we have over that um, to find the property where we have the best ability to make sure that, that we're controlling it. I really appreciate those kinds of adaptive moves. Thank you. That, that was some okay. of the questions I had. Thank you for the great presentation. Um, I'd like to move to the north end because we haven't talked about any of that. 
And I'm really concerned about the occupancy levels up there on places that have not yet been addressed. And one of the things that I thought I heard you say in your look to the future is looking outside of the project area. And my question was, does that mean with over 26% occupancy and I mean, up to 60 some percent occupancy in areas up there that we're done with the project area or give me a little bit more context for those comments. Yeah, no, it definitely does not. It, it just means that we should also have plans for irrigated agricultural properties that don't fit within that prescribed boundary. So as we're doing an evaluation, we also want to be sure that we're looking at other areas to be sure that we're focused on where we can have the most impact and the most benefit to recovering irrigated agriculture on open space. So no, that not a so let's stay with the project area, but add consider adding other areas. I don't think that we've determined that yet. I, I think we need to take the time to really sit down and look at it. We haven't fully determined what the scope is of what we're going to look at, but certainly there are irrigated agricultural fields with prairie dogs that don't sit within the northern project area. We don't want to forget about those as we're looking okay. at things. So definitely more to come on that as, as staff have had time to sit down and, and far more specifically define exactly how we want to evaluate all of that information. So when we originally went through the plan for this project area, um, I remember hearing from staff that we were going to contract out the lethal control um, to get started rapidly. And what I've heard now is that it's difficult to get contractors and expensive. And so my question about the northern removal areas is, have we looked at a less expensive option of doing internal seasonal uh, staff and perk machines. And uh, one of our public comments this evening indicated that it was not that expensive to make that shift. So my question, and I see Andy up on the screen there, <laughs> is what do you think, Andy? <laughs> Yeah, could, we get, and, could we get closer to the 200 acre treatment target by bringing that in house with seasonals and, and our own perk machines? Yeah, that's something that we're really looking at more closely. I, um, I'm reaching out to the county to get more details on, on their cost and their information. Um, you'll note, I think they have a meeting coming up next week or so, but it is something that we're we're really putting the pencil to the paper to, to look at much more closely uh, moving forward. If I could just add though, it's, it's just not whether or not we have the ability to go out and remove 200 acres. It's then, are we able to effectively barrier those to prevent relocation? Once they're removed, are we, is there water infrastructure in place and irrigation infrastructure for us to bring water onto the property effectively then to do immediately the restoration because removal is just the first step. If we're not right. able to effectively restore, then we haven't really met our goal. So we need to look at all of the factors. Is It's not just, can we remove them? It's what do we do after removal? Can we barrier, the, barrier them effectively? What is the cost of doing that? And can we bring the uh, uh, restoration program onto that property? And if not, what do we need to do to prepare that property for restoration? So it's that whole combination that we are wanting to analyze at a more scalpel level. When we talked to you all in 2019 in the community, it was almost like a 30% design conceptual. Right, right. But then when we start looking at each single property with infrastructure, uh, with the restoration program, with the removal program, with the relocation program, then we're able to see on a very detailed level of what's working, what's not working like we thought. And that's why we wanna do this analysis over the next four months. Well, and, and you all are getting much more uh, substantively and in detail into the restoration process right. than we ever talked about in 
2018, 2019. And that's the end goal. The end goal exactly. is to get this back online for productive, for productive agriculture. agriculture. And that's right. where the restoration program comes into play. Right. So if, if we were able to shift to that, um, could that enable us to get closer to the 200 acres per year target? And what kind of timeline are we looking at? And what kind of budget would we be looking at on the barrier program? And those are budget policy decisions. And so, yes, we're going to be looking at how we do removal. And you just indicated that part of our evaluation is what would it do to bring internally in these resources to do that? But then we also are taking that property by property, field by field look about what the barrier options are, uh, what are the hinder, you know, what are the barriers to the barrier program? And then that, what is the opportunity to bring the restoration program onto these fields and these properties? And we may find, and I'm, I'm saying may in a capital M-A-Y, that some of our best opportunities may not necessarily always fall within the project area. So what's that mean Which just in terms of communicating that to uh, the community? There was a comment somewhere in the packet that in the area, in some area that had that exceeded 26% occupancy, perhaps cattle were the answer. It was in, I think it was in the answers to questions. It was in the answers to questions. I, I what think is that talking about? I think basically what that was, and and I don't I don't remember exactly which question it was, but I think that was a question as to whether we would be removing prairie dogs from those areas or what we were going to do about the prairie dogs in those areas. And I think um, the answer was intended to say, right now our removal efforts are focused on irrigated agricultural lands. And so we won't be in the foreseeable future likely looking at removing from non-irrigated areas while we address those irrigated areas, which have been identified as the highest priority. Um, but that we're looking at any other tools that may be available to us. And so to the degree that those are leased and grazed lands, I mean, every year we look at our grazing program and see if there are tweaks that need to happen to that prescribed grazing. And both prairie dogs and cattle are grazers. And so looking at the combination of the two is an important factor that we do have control over um, in those areas. So I think that was just meant as an example of one of the many things that we look at if we're seeing degradation the vegetation in an area due to overgrazing from prairie dogs and or cattle. Um, you know, we, we control others are, are certainly also in the mix. So that was the intention of that answer. I don't know if that's what it's right. since I don't have her own ideas, but that helps. Thanks. Um, are there any other comments about the northern area before we move further in this discussion? And I just want to point out the time here, Karen. We'll yeah. A bit over. And, and just to remind us that we are promising to come back in the spring and, uh, and likely before final decisions make on the relocation program this year. Okay. Before we move on, I've heard concerns from the board about the use of Superior West as a receiving site for multiple different, different people. Um, I think I've heard encouraging the permitting and use of other receiving sites, um, as Heather put it, in parallel. Um, is there anything that we want to say as a board group about the northern area and not that, but just getting access to those maps that, that were yeah, let me I'll come to that in a minute. John and Dan, Dave and Michelle, any interest in saying as a board anything about the northern area and looking at um, bringing 
encouraging the continued use of bringing the lethal control in-house with seasonals and any of those strategies that were just discussed or not? No, I trust the department to make the right decisions there. I, I support looking into those options and seeing if that is yeah. better or worthwhile for OSP as a whole and deciding if Boulder County is doing that and they're having success with it. I, I definitely think it would be worth our while to speak with them and get some information from them about that. Yeah. And also the receiving sites, both on the system and off the system. So that it's just that what we can do on the system, where else might there be some options? And what about you on Northern? Um, yeah, lethal control. Yeah, I think we ought to look uh, a little more closely into uh, you know the costs and that sort of thing. I think you know you're going to check or meet with the county and you know follow up on that. So I think that would be very helpful. Okay. I have all these notes captured here, and Great. that's something we can come back in the spring with. Great. Okay. I think we've summarized our concerns, interests, input. And thank you very much for all of that. All of this detailed work. And, and as Caroline pointed out, we're all eager to see this map. So if, if you could let us know when it's functional, that would be great. So just so you know, our next step is that an information packet will go to council which will include what we provided you as well as generally the, um, you know, what's happened here tonight. Um, and then we'll obviously be talking with you again in the spring. And so what's the time frame on that? I don't know if that's scheduled at the board level it, yet. It, it isn't. I think we've tentatively thought about mid to late Q2. Well, that's good. No, I, I meant the council. Oh, oh, that was cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we usually follow this meeting up with that. That packet has been our routine the last few years. Okay. And can can we the board get a copy of that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I can send that along. And in what we just said, um, I just want to make sure that council is aware because it seemed like what we said that there is some strain in the receiving sites. So just making sure that they are on notice for that if moving forward. Um, that turns into more than what it is now. So they have that information in the packet. Um, since all the plans were made with the receiving sites being a huge part of the management. So um, just putting them on notice that, you know, whatever the current status um, would be of that. So that when we bring it to them again, moving forward, if that declines anymore, that they're aware that it's not, um, perhaps where it was left on the original management plan. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Tori. Thanks, Heather. May I suggest uh, a break until 8.30 and then we can bring the uh, utility step in? Right, sounds Thanks, good. <laughs> Karen, we're ready to roll. I think we are. I'm muted and we're recording.
Okay, great. Well, welcome back, everyone. So our last uh, subject matter for our matters from the board is to discuss a component of the South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project. And just to remind our first, those who haven't been keeping uh, as detailed the track of this project, uh, I'll just remind us last year, last summer, uh, well, as we all know, the flood mitigation project is a very complex uh, a project with a lot of different uh, sort of micro components uh, that are associated with it. A few of those components of, uh, have impacts in our uh, of particular interest to the OSMP and the OSBT. And last year, the utility staff uh, came to the board in the summer to uh, uh, provide the board with an update on its 30% design uh, uh, of, the, of the whole project, but with a particular uh, focus in on those uh, components uh, and those subject matters that are of interest to the OSMP system, such as groundwater and the actual flood wall. And, uh, and so tonight, we are actually going to be looking at another component of the flood mitigation project that has a high interest to the OSMP and the OSBT, and that is uh, the mitigation and restoration opportunities on the 119 acres that is owned by uh, the university and that is often referred to as the OSO. So again, um, a lot of components with the project and we're, uh, the, the goal of tonight is to take one of those central components that is uh, important to the department and our system and that is uh, how to mitigate and, and restore uh, uh, impacts uh, to that the project will have on OSMP and uh, the best opportunity for that is on the 119 acres. So utility staff is going to uh, give us an update on that. And I'll just make note that our department has been very uh, specifically involved in this component of the project led by uh, Don D'Amico. Uh, so Don will also be uh, doing some of the presentation and will be available for questions as it relates to the restoration opportunities on the 119 acres. So with that, I think I'm gonna first turn it over to Brandon Coleman from the Utilities Department to lead us off in the first half of the presentation. And then Don D'Amico will uh, 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 lead the second part of the presentation. Thanks, Dan. Okay. And just for the public, we expect the presentation to be approximately how long? Have how long are you guys going to talk for? Uh, I think probably 15 minutes is how long our presentation is going to be. So, okay. And then we're here to answer questions afterwards as well. Okay, great. Um, great. So thank you to the board for having us back again. Um, I'm Brandon Coleman, uh, the engineering manager with the Storm Flood Utility. So um, working on the South Boulder Creek Flood Mitigation Project. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, let's see here. Oh, I can't click on Yes, if you can click <laughs> following along. Um, so tonight we're just going to go over a brief overview of the flood mitigation project. We've talked about the project, um, as Dan mentioned, quite a few times here uh, with the Open Space Board. So we'll revisit some of the key highlights of the flood mitigation project. And then we'll go over the OSO area, which is, stands for Open Space Other Areas, a land use designation from our planning department. Um, for the CU South property. So we'll go over some of the components of the OSO. And then, then we'll go over the restoration concept, which is really focused on that OSO area. And last, we'll just go over next steps in the project schedule where we're at with the project schedule. Slide. Um, uh, so first we'll start with the South Boulder Creek Flood Mitigation Project. Go to the next slide here. Um, so just a brief history of flooding on South Boulder Creek. South Boulder Creek's uh, flooded significantly in the past three times, uh, once in 1938, again in 1969, and most recently in 2013. Um, and 2013, the picture on the right here is Koala Drive uh, during that 2013 flood. And to me, it always really illustrates the need for the project. Um, you can see how much water was actually flowing down in that area. Uh, during 2013. So let's go to the next slide. So the main purpose of the flood mitigation project is protecting life and safety. And this figure just shows the South Polar Creek floodplain, uh, the 100-year floodplain. 
And then uh, the outlined area in red is the CU South property for reference. And um, really, if you click one more time, the purpose of the project is to mitigate flooding in this area, which is commonly referred to as the West Valley area. Um, so in a hundred year flood, flood waters will overtop US 36. Brandon, we lost your sound on Zoom there just for a minute. Can you just repeat that last sentence or two? Yes, I sure can. Uh, let me go back here. So, Brandon, it's lost to posterity. Thanks. Sorry, Brandon. No, that's okay. I'm happy. I just got to back up uh, in my notes. So, uh, so, really, the goal of the flood mitigation project is uh, to detain the flood waters that would overtop US 36 and really focused on mitigating flooding in this area, which is highlighted here, um, commonly referred to as the West Valley. And I think that caught it all. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so um, really to be able to do upstream flood mitigation, so to mitigate that flooding upstream of where the impacts are, um, we're going to, we've proposed detention in this area, and that's uh, part of the South Boulder Creek flood mitigation plan. So this would be phase one of three. And this figure, we've been over a lot of these design components before, so I'm not going to go into detail tonight on these, but our detention facility is just upstream of US 36. It's on property that's currently owned by uh, CU Boulder, also CDOT in the US 36 right of way and OSMP uh, on the Van Leap property. And the components of the detention facility include an earthen embankment, which is shown on the left-hand side of the screen here, which transitions into a floodway slash spill wall, spillway, sorry, a flood wall that transitions into a spillway. Uh, and then uh, detention excavation to get us the volume we need to be able to mitigate that flooding. And then an outlet works that actually discharges the water after it's been detained under US 36 back into Vila Channel and South Boulder Creek, ultimately. So, um, the last presentation we were here, uh, we discussed the 30% design and we're currently working on the 60% design. And also the 30% design documents have been posted to the project webpage if anybody's interested. Randy, can you tell us what the orange uh, component is? Yes, yeah, so the orange component is a uh, fill to maintain access to the site. So it would be South Loop Drive fill. So to maintain that existing road that's on the property, we would need to ramp up over our earthen embankment. And that's what that's depicting. Okay. Um, so we talked about this last time, and uh, these impacts are based on our 30% design. And um, this is about these are the impacts to the existing open space property that we've been talking about and that we've been working to minimize throughout the design process. So the estimates for the impacts are about 5.1 acres currently, uh, 1.6 acres of temporary impacts and 3.5 acres of permanent impacts. Um, these will be on the Van Fleet properties and there will be impacts to wetlands, Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse and usually trust orchid habitats within these five acres. Um, and we do discuss the impacts to the resources more in the memo uh, that we provided for tonight. And as a key component of the design is always looking for ways to minimize this corridor uh, through construction methodologies and also design of the actual floodway and spillway. And on the table in the memo, which you just mentioned, the project total numbers are all on CU property, is that correct? The project total numbers include these five acres and the uh, impacts. Uh, let me see. Uh, the Van Vliet property numbers are here, labeled OSMP. Yes. And then there's 77.8 acres of permanent impacts somewhere else. Is that all CU South? Is the other property all CU South? Yes, CU South and the CDOT right of way. And CDOT. Yeah. Yep, that's where the other impacts would be. Thank so, you. And that's inclusive of these five acres. So that's for the overall cost. Yes. Okay. Thanks.
Um, so we've shared this slide before, but it's just important to point out this is a very important uh, resource area for OSMP and for the city. Um, and just some of the resources that we find in the area um, that we see impacts to um, include the Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse and the Lady Tress Orchid, which are threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. Um, there's also environmental sensitive species in the area, including the Northern Leopard, fr leopard Frog and the Bobo Link. And uh, the project also lies within the larger South Boulder Creek State Natural Area, um, which is and denoted that way because it's a globally rare uh, mesic tall grass prairie habitat. Um, and it's also found to be some of the most productive agricultural land in the OSMP system. So just some of the resources in that area. <clears throat> so next, um, we're gonna talk a little bit just about the open space other area. So this was a land designation for future potential open space that the city gives, and it was uh, designated through the CU South um, land use planning through the annexation. So the open space other area, oh, I gotta, if you could click one more time, sorry, Ford. I got some arrows that pop up. So this boundary is really the open space other area we're talking about here. Um, and it's about 119 acres. Uh, it's historically been mined for gravel from about 1956 until the early 1990s. Um, and we are able to acquire this property through the terms that were laid out in the CU South annexation agreement. So um, and that acquisition would be part of the flood project. So all 119 acres would come over to the uh, city as part of the CU South annexation and through the flood mitigation project. Um, historically, a large portion of this area was located in the South Bowl Creek floodplain, and it's actually been disconnected by a levee that was constructed during mining and One more time. See you again. That's okay. I know which arrow okay, I need to get. <clears throat> and now for the red arrow. Uh, back once. There you go. Um, <laughs> So this lines the existing levee out there, and um, it was, I'll back up a little bit. Um, the levee was constructed during mining and certified by FEMA in 2009. Uh, and this creates a physical and hydraulic barrier from the existing South Boulder Creek floodplain. Um, and that's represented by the floodplains you can see here, the 100 year and the 500 year. Um, so the area behind the levee is kind of a key area for the restoration as it has been disconnected from the floodplain and we'd like to reconnect that to the historic floodplain. So if you click one more time, I'll just point to that area one, one more. There we go, okay. Um, so this is an area that's key for the restoration because currently it's disconnected from the South Boulder Creek floodplain and with removal of the levee, we'd expect that to be reconnected um, in the future. And then if you go to the next slide, and then this slide um, I added just to show, this is the floodplain mapping based on the proposed project. And you can see if you focus really in kind of where it says CU levy there, um, it's kind of mimicking what the existing floodplain is. So we're not changing um, what we would expect the floodplain to be aside from the fact that we would actually be flooding that in a hundred year event now. Um, so this is what the proposed conditions modeling currently show with the project in place. And the the what's shown as 500 year on that map is all within the pond behind the detention of uh, earthen berm. All within the pond behind. Yes, yes, that's correct. So the way our facility works in a 500 year event is it would all be detained aside from the amount that would spill over our spillway and then continue down that flood path that we've seen historically. Okay, so uh, what we want to make sure we understand is that, that the actual, the OSO, the 119 acres, it, 
if the levy is removed, will be then part of the 100 year and 500 year plan. Correct. Mm -hmm. The 119 is all in the 100 year, right? Well, it'll be in a 500 year. Mm -hmm. but Right. Currently, yeah. currently yeah. it's not. So with the levy in place, it's not in the hundred year floodplain. Right. But um, I just wanted to show that the only real change in this figure is that now the hundred year floodplain is in that figure. Yeah. Um, so with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Don who's been working on this project with us. Um, and he's gonna talk about the restoration concept that we've come up with. So uh, utilities staff and open space staff have been just tip tip your um, top up. Yeah, there you go. We, we're losing your face. So your beautiful face. Then. <laughs> uh, utility staff and open space staff have been working with RJH consultants. Uh, Westerbelt Ecological Services and the Headwaters Corporation to develop a, a conceptual design for the environmental mitigation and restoration of the OSO area. The Westerbelt Headwaters team has designed and built a number of uh, wetland projects in Colorado and Nebraska, including the restoration design work they did for us on the Lower Boulder Creek wetland project, uh, getting ready to start construction on in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. So we have uh, really two key objectives that are guiding our work. Um, they are to meet the regulatory mitigation requirements of the flood project as um, required by the various regulatory agencies. Um, are we on the same page? No, we're, we should be on the first page. <laughs> there we go. Um, <laughs> Um, and then to address recommendations and feedback from the Open Space Board of Trustees and from Open Space staff. Next slide. We also developed uh, some more specific goals, uh, project goals to help our mitigation design conversations and discussions. And they include maximizing the ecological restoration across the site, both in wetlands and in upland areas. Minimizing impacts to existing ladies' tresses, orchid, and pebbles meadow jumping mouse habitat, also uh, wetlands, native grasslands, and other resources. Increasing floodplain connectivity between the restoration area and South Boulder Creek, uh, addressing hydrology, and ensuring that the long term sustainability of wetlands and uplands occurs and maintaining existing irrigation systems in the area, most notably Dry Creek number two ditch. This area is, is really <clears throat> very complex, largely due to the past land uses that are here, mostly mining. You can see on the map on the right, um, the different habitat types that occur over the site. So given that, we found it useful to um, view the site as having kind of four distinct or unique areas that require different approaches to restoration design. Uh, the first of those, uh, it is the largest, and it includes the area that was most intensively mined for gravel in the past. Nearly all of the alluvial soils and the overlying vegetation were removed, leaving uh, very poor quality soils and low functioning upland plant communities comprised mostly of non native species. This left the mining also left the area about 10 to 15 feet lower than the adjacent land and uh, elevations that it was prior to mining and it exposed the bedrock in some areas um, that's composed of weather, really weathered pier shale, marine-based shale. So few of the species that inhabited the site prior to mining are left that still occur. And very importantly, uh, the natural groundwater hydrology in this area has been significantly altered and doesn't function really any, anything like it did before mining. Second area, um, Brandon mentioned the um, levy on the CU South property. Um, the levy fragments habitat within the um, land inside to the west of the levy, um, fragments it from habitat outside or to the east of the levy on open space land. Uh, it also affects hydrology on both sides and it 
really creates a pretty effective barrier to movement for many riparian and floodplain dependent species. Third area is outside the le levee, generally to the uh, southeast. This area wasn't intensively mined in the past, but it was disturbed a little bit, some potholing, some a uh, little bit of material moved around. Um, the floodplain soils are still relatively intact, and the ground elevation here is uh, similar to the same um, as the undisturbed floodplain on open space to the east. Um, they, the groundwater hydrology, we're assuming that the ground, groundwater hydrology is, is um, still fairly intact. And then lastly, fourth area is to the south of the levee. And this area was also mined and um, I would call it minimally restored. It has five basins that were created by placing berms uh, across the mined area, which created these, these wetland areas that are dominated by cattails. These are very low functioning uh, wetlands with very little in terms of habitat diversity. We know there are um, Lady's Tresses orchids on the berms around the two northernmost um, of those cells. And there are likely orchids around the, the three southernmost cells or ponds also. Um, we have yet to do surveys, priority surveys in those four southern cells. Um, so we need to do that to um, identify Spiranthes habitat there and, and um, the other resources that are located in that area to understand the restoration potential better there. Um, until we do that, our concept design in this area is going to be more general. So, Don, the water in those ponds is groundwater? Uh, yes, it is. Um, we think. Again, the, you know, the, the ground surface to the west and to the east of that area is still unmined and intact and, and flood irrigated. It still has a somewhat natural groundwater uh, system running through it. So that's why the, you know, the, the, those cells still have some connection to the groundwater system in that area. So the graph concept design that we worked on was, was developed knowing that these differences across the site would dictate the type of an approach to restoration that would be most successful. So here is um, the draft concept mitigation design for the main restoration area that the team developed thus far. The concept is meant to mimic historic floodplain features and habitats such as wet meadow wetlands, native grasslands, and troublings that occurred prior to gravel mining. And this is going to require a lot of excavation in this area to, um, to reestablish these types of habitats. And as I mentioned, um, within this mined area, the bedrock is really shallow. Um, it's overlain by, in some places, not much or barely, barely any kind of um, topsoil, I guess you could call it generically. Um, because the shale isn't the greatest growth medium for the types of plant communities we're trying to establish, um, some of this area may require excavation into the bedrock. We estimate right now that in some areas we'll need to excavate about two feet into the bedrock and then fill that area with a couple of feet of suitable growth material, uh, topsoil and you know, basically soil uh, media that will allow those plants to grow in those communities to develop. But the concept of design will also include the use of existing dry creek ditch number two, irrigation water for site establishment and possibly um, uh, for future management of the site. But the arrows that you should see up there show um, where the uh, Connections would typically come into the site from Dry Creek number two. Dry Creek number two wraps around the outlet. Um, we'll, we'll likely end up putting some types of control structures, turnout structures, and those types of things to get water from Dry Creek number two into the site. So the grading target elevations in this area were derived from a uh, hydrologic target elevation, based, basically based on a, uh, a desired hydrology. Um, wet meadow wetlands that will be created, shown here by these, um, these uh, red stars, will be graded. I think we're, we're behind or ahead. Oh, back. Back one more. Sorry. There we go. So this is the, these are the areas that will um, 
where we'll be creating wet meadows. And so the, um, these areas will be graded to that design elevation. And the intent is to support wet meadow species, such as sedges and rushes, as well as wetland grasses and forbs. Um, this habitat will be similar in a lot of ways to much of the habitat in the flood project area along US 36, where we find these types of habitats and also where a lot of the latest trusses organs occur. So we hope to recreate that type of habitat in, in this area. Uh, next, um, the dark green, era, dark green areas with the arrows and the red stars shown here are where seasonally inundated emergent marshes will be created. And um, they're meant to resemble abandoned channel features or swales that were formed um, by creek meandering over the millennia, thousands of years, um, across the floodplain and where overflow channels have been created. So these areas will be rated to about half a foot uh, below the target elevation, and we'll have a target hydrology that will support those types of seasonally inundated um, marshes. They'll be, so they'll be basically wetter than the, the previous areas I showed. So Donna, in those areas, so where are we going to get the vegetative material for them? The plants? Yes. Talk about that. But yeah, uh, <coughs> a lot of seeding um, and some planting. So. <coughs> So the last area within this um, major restoration area is um, on the north end of the site where this red star is here. And this area will be graded a half a foot above the target elevation. And as a result, will be drier than the um, uh, other two areas. This is where we'll be establishing um, riparian shrub and native grasslands. The remaining areas around, surrounding this main restoration area will see this buffer and will receive a combination of upland restoration and um, protection of existing wetlands and orchid habitat that currently exists there. Just so I'm clear, the, the seasonally inundation, inundated marshes are lower or higher than the wet meadow areas? They are lower than the wet meadow areas. So they're the lowest of all three. Yes, that's right. They're the lowest and wettest of all years. So they'll have um, species like um, bulrush, um, some of this, uh, there's a lot of different kind of generic, generic name for a taller, taller wetland species, but uh, more adapted to wetter conditions. But not necessarily cattails. <laughs> oh, hopefully, that would not be the, yeah. the intent. Um, so moving on to other areas in the OSO, um, Brandon mentioned the, the levee. Um, so we're going to be removing the levee and restoring the land under the levee. And so this is going to provide greater hydrologic and habitat connectivity to the existing South Boulder Creek floodplain, which, as you know, includes the South Boulder Creek State Natural Area. Next, um, for the area outside the levee to the southeast, we'll take a, a a softer approach here because it hasn't been as intensively mined. Um, so we're going to be looking at mostly en enhancement here, especially of pebbles habitat, rather than you know kind of any regrading or uh, manipulation of the ground surface. So a lot of that will involve removing non-native species and planting native shrubs and trees. Um, that, that'll be the main restoration approach here. And then uh, lastly, uh, again, depending on the presence of existing resources that we'll know about after we do some additional surveying in this area, the goals for the southern area are to create wet meadow wetlands where there are currently those, as I mentioned, those low diversity cattail areas by filling those mine basins to a point where we have, we, we can establish appropriate hydrology to support those wet meadows and um, the typical species you find there, sedges, rushes, um, hopefully, um, We'll be uh, targeting you, ladies, trusses orchid habitat there um, because of the presence of those orchids just um, immediately to the north. But right now we don't, we just don't have enough information on the hydrology um, or the, the resources there to um, really focus on the design. It, it's going to take a kind of a more nuanced and um, surgical approach because we are, again, we are anticipating that there will be some um, ladies, trusses orchids that we do find further to the south. So all of these areas that I've talked about that, that will be graded will be um, 
uh, seeded with native wetland and upland seeds. And pollinator species will be incorporated into these seed mixes to increase pollinator habitat across the project area. Um, as I mentioned, shrub planting to create an enhanced habitat for prebles and other species will also be incorporated into the design. Um, and so that the, plant material? I'm sorry? The source of that plant material? Um, we've been using a, a, a number of um, commercial sources. We've also upped our um, uh, volunteer efforts to collect local sources for native seed. Um, one species in particular that we don't buy from nurseries is, um, is uh, um, draw a blank here. Um, on the tall, tall grass species, uh, big blue stuff. Um, just genetically, it, 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 it's not close enough to what we have. Um, the switchgrass is a similar species, so we try to collect some species locally that we, we are confident of their um, genetics, um, but we do do, do a lot of um, uh, volunteer seed collecting and most of our seeds, just because of the volume we'll need for a project this big will be from commercial sources. So Dad, are we planning on salvaging, using any salvage material from the construction of the- Yeah, the that, that's a really good point. Um, that, that uh, material that will be impacted, um, excavated from the spillway area, the project area on the Bambly portion of open space, that will be really critical material to use on the project site. It, it has a seed bank, presumably it has a really good seed bank and it even has live plants. Um, we're, we're, we're working now on a kind of an approach, a, a modified or improved, hopefully improved approach to the way we uh, did the, the previous um, uh, granite. transplant of orchids from this property onto the granite property. Um, I think we learned a lot from that and others, uh, other um, uh, agencies have done some transplants and there's a, it's kind of some new information out there about how to successfully transplant orchids in general, um, maybe not specifically spiranthes, but um, orchids in general to um, be more successful. Can you take a minute to describe the boundaries, how, how the bond, boundaries define this area? And we've all, always focused on the, the state natural area and the open space to the kind of east and south of, of the site. But what about the area to the west as far as its relationship uh, with this particular parcel? How do we come up with the, or how were these boundaries derived? <coughs> The 119 or the restoration the subset? So 119. So um, I'm talking about between the trailer park and the, the white, well, the white line. How were the white lines defined? And then what are our expectations on the role of the area west of the 119 as far as the context for the whole area? Sure. Yeah. So, but yeah. So the, the white boundary is that OSO we've been talking about. So that line is a combination of the CU South property boundary. So that's really what you'll see on the southern end and the eastern end is the extents of where the CU South property right. ends. And then on the western extents, that's really the limits of where we would expect the flooding to end if the levee were not in place. So really anywhere we would see floodplain is how we came up with that western boundary for the host. So that's unrelated to the ditch. To Dry Creek Ditch Number right. Two, yeah, yes. Dry Creek Dry Creek Ditch Number Two um, borders the eastern curved line of the OS the levee, right? Right, it, it basically yes. parallels the levee, and so you get down to the um, sorry, I don't have a pointer. So you get down to the southern area right. where the levee wraps around the edge. That Dry Creek Number Two comes in there, and it just it was relocated when they when they mined and built the levee. So on the west side, that property that's the CU property, what's our expectation as far as its role in what we're talking about as far as uh, mitigation and restoration? Okay, <laughs> environmental. How are we expecting that to relate to what we're talking about? You mean like people movement or, or buildings or? Mostly, uh, kind of what comes off that 
Are, are we expecting drainage? yeah drainage to come off that property? And you know, kind of, have we talked to see you about their management of you know the undeveloped part of that property? As far as I know, we have not. But uh, some of that is in the annexation agreement. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Setbacks and visual buffers and things that have been put in the annexation agreement. So, but no. specific development plans, as far as I know, have not been developed. Yet. But that's a good point, Dave. You're talking about connectivity or right. transition between um, open space on the little o, little s open space on the OSO and the developed future developed right. CU property, right? Whether it's going to be a building here and then open space here, right. or whether there's going to be some logical, meaningful transition right. from open space to develop. Because we focused a lot, rightfully so, on the other parts of this and the relationship that I haven't heard a whole lot about the, the relationship on the west side, which I think is equally important. Well, I, I don't know if it's equally important, but it is important. And the other part of that that I think is important that has from time to time been commented on, both by CU and by OSUP, is whether there's trail connectivity. Well, yeah. And right. the issue has always been resolved with the statement that says something to the effect of trails will be established by OSMP normal processes, but they yes. won't be lines drawn by CU or by OSMP just looking at a map and saying, we're gonna have a trail here and here. Yeah. If, if there's trails that are desired or there's going to be looking at trails on what becomes open space, assuming this 119 becomes open space managed property, what we have said is we cannot commit to what a trail system and if there'll be a trail system on the 119 uh, until we know more about the mitigation project. The mitigation project short term takes precedent and that any trail talk and any planning will go through our normal trail planning processes. So that would mean, you know, beginning with the staff level analysis, moving into public engagement, board engagement, council engagement. So- uh, And would require the restoration first of 119 acres, right? Right, and, and depending on how much time the restoration needs to sit and, and, and take hold, all those factors would need to be looked at before and during any analysis of what a what if any trail system would look like on the 119. Uh, that's not saying what CU could decide to do for a trail on system property. on their property. Yeah. Just wanted to make a point. <laughs> it's worth uh, focusing on the west side uh, as well, as far as the, however it's going to relate to the restored area. Okay, um, so it's back over to me now. So really, uh, Don mentioned those key goals of the restoration at the start here, and one of those is actually to meet the regulatory uh, mitigation requirements of the project. Um, and this table, this is a summarized version of a table that was included in the memo, but it really shows uh, what we're thinking are going to be the mitigation ratios required for the estimated project impacts. Um, and we just kind of want to walk through this table. So um, as far as the regulatory criteria goes, uh, the types of impacts that will be regulated are we're looking at wetlands, so federally designated wetlands through the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, through the Clean Water Act, um, also wetland regulations through the city of Boulder. Um, so the Boulder Revised Code has wetland regulations in it as well. Um, there's Preble Meadow Jumping Mouse Habitat, which is just a uh, probable habitat for the species. And there's also in the area of Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse Creek. <laughs> designated habitat, which is a, a much higher designation for Preble's Meadow jump, Jumping Mouse. Um, it's been designated at a federal level for critical to the species. Um, and then you- Does later, that necessarily mean it's occupied or not? Um, I would, so we think all that habitat could potentially be occupied, so. But even the critical habitat is not now occupied. It's considered, it's considered occupied. Yes considered occupied, but there hasn't been any Preble's Meadow Jumping Mice trapped there, or? Well, there's been, there have been Preble's trapped along South Hill Creek. Right. Um, to define a, a specific area where they occur, it's more that they've right. been found and they can range a certain distance out from um, different uh, 
different types of habitats, say a creek or a ditch. So the you know they set the you know the the um, buffers and the probable habitat that it can extend out from the, the known habitat. I guess it's a little. So this includes the known habitat where they've been trapped, plus an area that they could occupy, known knowing their range. Yes. And, and the real difference here is just the federal designation. So I think all the habitat is potentially occupied Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse habitat. That's what we found with open space and through um, our research as well. But the critical designation is actually related to the threatened designation for the species. So that was an area identified as important to the species um, to protect. So that's where that critical designation comes from. So it's just a different designation from a regulatory standpoint. I think we would expect Preble's metal jumping mouse in all these habitat areas. So Brandon, on, on this table, the minimum ratio then is defined by the federal regulatory context, right? Yes. It's U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, right. essentially, or the core, which takes the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, requirements. Why don't we put all of the, and, you know, the, excepting the city of Boulder wetland, why don't we put the, those then, you know, core or fish and wildlife service uh, on the other habitats? So, so, on, on, so that we know that, sure. you know, the, the, those are the permitting standards uh, for those particular species. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. And because the first two rows do that, right? Right, yes, you're, you're correct. So, for the Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse habitat, both critical and just um, potential habitat, that's U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And then for the Ute Lady Trust Orchid, that would be U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And we would work through that agency through the core. So, the core is going to be our lead agency. Right. So, they would actually be the agency consulting with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for impacts and mitigation efforts related to those species. Yeah, I think it would be helpful just to you know have that on there. <laughs> yeah, and I think it would also be helpful to have the word that you just used, potential Preble's Meadow jumping bounce habitat versus critical. Oh, and yes, I, I think the critical is really important because it is a federal designation <laughs> and you'll see the mitigation ratios Historically, are much higher if you're in that. right, but the other one is potential, right? That's what you just said verbally. It, yes, it's identified as you would expect to find Preble's Meadow jumping mouse in there. So, so I'd add that word there to differentiate between those two. Yeah, I, yeah, we we can we can further clarify those to make. I know it's, it is confusing because there's potential habitat, there's occupied habitat, there's critical habitat. Yes, um, and it's. Yeah, and so unless you put those words on there, we don't know what it means. Sure your point. Yeah. Thanks. I guess I'm confused then based on what Karen said and what you responded. I always thought the four to one ratio for Prebles was occupied habitat. And the critical then was occupied habitat plus additional potential yes. habitat. So for me, rather than than saying if four to one is potential, it's accurate, right? But sure, yeah, that's, I mean, that's the assumption. up there to say what. Yeah, yeah. whatever it yeah, takes, I think, just to kind yeah. of cryptically clarify. Right, so <laughs> when we consult, we would assume that this acreage and this habitat has Preble's Meadow Jumping Ice yes. in it. Yes. Occupy. Occupy, yes. And what about the, the row for you ladies tresses orchids? Is that occupied, mapped, or is that potential, or is that that's suitable? It's not. Suitable. It's not the. It's yeah. not the same because it's not the same. Um, I know it's a plant instead of an insect. Exactly. <laughs> so it's not running around at night. Right. It's <laughs> identified by a certain set of criteria, associated species. Um, in kind of known hydrology where spiranthes occur. <laughs> so that's how you ladies tresses or habitat is identified. So you could put it occupied and or and or suitable, right? Correct. Both, both. Yes. Right. Because when you when you consult for you lady tress orchids, they're gonna look at impacts to specific 
plants, right, for fish and wildlife, but to mitigate those impacts, you would go to try and create suitable habitat someplace. Yes, and I think that's why those labels are important. Great. Okay, thanks. Sure. Great. Um, right. um, okay, so moving on just to the minimum ratio. So, um, these are estimated currently because we still have to consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and, but based on our project experience and what regulations tell us, these is what we would expect um, for the minimum mitigation ratio for these impacts. So if we were impacting one acre of wetlands, um, uh, then we would be creating two acres of wetlands somewhere else to offset our impact. So that's how those ratios work. Um, and then you'll see there is that difference between the Prebles Meadow Jumping Mouse habitat and the federally designated critical habitat. That federal designation um, requires a higher mitigation ratio. So just based on our uh, impacts for the entire project, we're looking to mitigate for all our um, impacts for the project in this area. So um, with these ratios and the estimated um, impacts from the project. This is what we would expect our mitigation ratios or mitigation acreage needed to, uh, to offset the environmental impacts from the project. And um, that's for the whole project, not just for the impacts that was on the property. And then this re restoration area acreage is um, just based on the design that Don just showed you and kind of reviewed and um, that really, with the 119 acres available to us, we've tried to maximize as much restoration work as we can do on that. And that also creates a little bit of a buffer for um, creating those habitat types. And really, our proposed ratios um, are much higher than what would be required from a regulatory standpoint, um, which is a key goal of the project. So, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so next steps for the project. Um, we're currently, if you go to the next slide, thanks. <laughs> uh, so currently we're working on the 60% design, uh, from the design phase. We completed 30% design and posted that to the website presented here. On that, um, we are still working on environmental permitting, uh, currently working on our consultation with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for those uh, threatened species that we mentioned previously. Uh, the FEMA Clomer, the CDOT right of way, and dam safety reviews are major permits that the project will need. And uh, we continue to work on those as part of the design process. And some of the key agreements we're going to need um, agreements with OSMP moving forward, uh, the CDOT agreement, and direct ditch number two are all stakeholders in the project. And ideally, we're shooting to start construction late in 2024, uh, right now. And then um, we mentioned in the memo just that we're working on when we come back to the board next. And that is all we have. I think, Joe, did you wanna close us out with anything? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So good evening board members. And just uh, a few quick comments here to wrap us up. I'm Joe Tadiucci. I'm the director of the utilities department. Quickly wanna introduce Chris Douglas, who is our uh, utilities engineering manager um, works with Brandon and I'd really like to thank Brandon and Don for all the work that went into the presentation and the memo and, and working with our consultants uh, to get this concept to the, to the point it's at. And uh, also appreciate Dan and, and others in the department uh, for lending your expertise to this environmental mitigation and floodplain restoration work. Uh, it's, it's been a, a great team effort. Um, Brandon mentioned a couple of times the annexation agreement with the university and one of our primary goals in, in negotiating that was to get access, uh, have the ability to get access to that 119 acres of OSO and get, get all of it. Um, and we were able to do that. And so uh, tonight you got a glimpse of, of what could be done with the restoration on that. We do recognize that the flood project impacts, uh, the utilities flood project is going to uh, impact 
some of the most sensitive species out there. And uh, you saw some concepts of how we'll try to recreate habitat in that 119 acres, but uh, creating habitat and having the species regenerate are two different things. And, and we recognize that there's some risk to that. And, but hopefully with the strength of the ratios that Brandon just talked about on that last slide, uh, we'll have a decent chance at that restoration and at least we'll have uh, an overall net benefit to the project. So um, just wanted to make the, uh, a few statements like that. And I think that's the end of our presentation and happy to take questions. Thank you guys. Um, is it okay? I'll sure. start with my first question. On the last slide that you guys had um, pulled up, I just want to understand the color coordination that we have. There's the four different components, which is the it's, it was the last it's slide. The timeline. Slide. Slide. Yeah. <laughs> Thirty-two. Yeah. I can't see the numbers. I'm just oh, sorry. Uh, too far? Way too far. Yeah, way too far. Yeah, you're, you're <laughs> in previous stuff. All, all backup slides. Oh, that's <laughs> right. We don't have Sorry. to use all of these. These are just there. We go. There you go. <laughs> so blue, yellow, red, teal. We'll call that. I don't know. Maybe what color that is. Um, and Michelle, I'm sorry if you can't see these, but under stakeholder agreements is red. OSMP is in green, and the same with the yellow permitting, some of them are green. Can you tell me what the difference in those colors mean? Sure. Um, yeah, so I've broken it out kind of by key project milestones that we're going to have to hit. So the design is the first one, that's that upper row. The next one is the permitting aspect. Um, the third one is our stakeholder agreements. And the last one's construction. So those are all big milestones for the project. And to dive into it a little bit deeper, um, I did put, I tried to highlight things that would be of importance to uh, the OSBT. So that's why those two lines are in green. So environmental permitting in particular, and then we've broken out environmental permitting into a little bit more detail to talk about kind of the process around environmental permitting, starting with um, our jurisdictional determination with the Army Corps of Engineers um, to see if they are actually indeed the lead agency for the project. Um, then going into our threatened and endangered species consultation through the Army Corps with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and ultimately our uh, 404 waters of the U.S. permit, which would have all those requirements, those mitigation ratios that I mentioned. And we need both of those, or we need that permit and that process to be complete before we can get a City of Boulder wetland permit. So that's how that breaks down. And then the OSMP agreements I just highlighted uh, in green, essentially, because that's working with Open Space Board of Trustees, and there's um, probably going to be some interdepartmental MOUs and uh, disposal process later on uh, that we'll need to go through with the board. And what agreements are we talking about? Because they go through Q, because you don't have anything Q3 before. <laughs> you only have Q1 and Q3, and then it stops before Q3. Right. Or, but but what agreements are you talking about that we've agreed up until Q2 2024? So I would say every time we've come to the board or we're in the process of hopefully getting approval for a disposal in the future. So that's why that line is so long is we've tried to really interact with the open space board throughout the project and figure out what the requirements are and things like that. And ultimately that line ends um, that line can end whenever that agreement gets put in place, but we'll need it prior to construction. So that's why that line extends so long. So that is for the board and not OSMP? It, yes, it's an agreement with OSMP, but probably decision by the board. And I don't no, know. Dan, and, and board and council, but uh, Brandon, you also brought up that once a disposal would be executed, it would probably be memorialized in some sort of interdepartmental agreement. Uh, that would uh, lay out lay out the terms that was agreed to, and so you know there would be the actual approval process at the board level, at the council level, and then the execution of a an agreement to memorialize that. And so, and that's a, that's a time range. It could happen sooner than that. It could happen up until that line. 
uh, you know, this is just to give us a, you know, a viewpoint of, of when those talks are already happening, we're giving you information along the way, uh, you know, and depending on how those other processes work out, it, it could be sooner uh, than that, you know, it could be up to that line and the project gets delayed, it, I guess it could be amended to go a little bit further. I just wanted to know if that is an OSMP agreement or if that line is talking about an OSBT disposal, or I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page oh. with what that means, but only says OSMP. Okay, that's fine. So, Brandon, we can assume that everything to the left of the today black line that ends before that black line has been accomplished. Yes. Is final or done or yes, I, I can confirm everything that's left of that black line has been completed. So there already is the jurisdictional. Yeah, that was my question yes. because you you implied that that was still under okay. discussion. Don, that's not the 404 permit. So we did the jurisdictional determination is really a question to the Army Corps of based on the impacts and the footprints of the project. Do you think we have impacts to waters of the US, including wetlands? And they said, yes, you do. And so that means the core is the lead agency. So they did give us that jurisdictional determination. And the other question that came up in the public participation was whether we've gotten any kind of a written agreement yet with CDOT about allowing to use the right of way. So we're still working with CDOT. So we have submitted for our special use permit now. So they have started their review of our 30% design. And we also have an IGA with them now that we're working on with the hydraulic review of the project. So um, we're continuing to work with them on review of the project as we go forward, but we haven't finalized that agreement yet. Either. And have they approved or agreed to allow use of the CDOT right of way or not? We are working with them on that right now. So not yet. Okay. And according to this year, anticipating that by the end of this year? Uh, yes, by the end of this year, likely into 2024 a little bit, we'll be working with them. So we're working on scoping of what that looks like right now. We meet with CDOT monthly about the project. Um, so we are in close coordination with that. Can I add to that, Brandon? Sure. That I'm not sure, uh, Karen, if your question has to do with the tie-in to their embankment or if you're thinking about... Yeah. Well, and it has to do with the last letter that we saw, which yeah. was... Yeah. So um, they, they are well aware of our intention to, to connect to their embankment. Uh, if we... If we can't do that, we don't have a project and we don't have a game. And so uh, a couple of years ago, probably maybe a year and a half ago, Brandon and I were having discussions with my counterpart and, and his just to make sure that they understood that that was our concept. And so we don't have the final permits and everything, but they're aware that that's what we intend and they're working with us on that of time. So as we talked earlier, uh, it would be helpful, you know, the board did these uh, two resolutions that were uh, at, sent to council and you referenced it, referenced them in your memo. It would be helpful, I think, for this board now, since many of us weren't involved in one or more of these uh, resolutions, for you to real quickly walk us through kind of what you presented, which was very good and very helpful, but how how that uh, fits into uh, meeting the recommendations that this week uh, called for. Sure, we'd be uh, happy to walk through that. Um, so there were two resolutions that were referenced in the memo. One was in 2018 and one was in 2021. So the um, we've been using those throughout the process, throughout the design process, throughout the annexation agreement as kind of a way, kind of as Joe mentioned, the key criteria of getting that 119. So um, 
think, yeah, Brandon, I, I, if I were you, I would, I would start with the 2021, which okay. is the most current and based on the information of we need to impact lands outside of the CDOT right away, which was the difference between the 2018 and the 2021 document. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, there's, uh, for, the, for the public that may not have it pulled up, there's 12 different sections to that resolution that the board, the council, and, and uh, 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 to move forward with of conditions that would uh, want to be met. Um, and looking at this particular presentation tonight, the references that I see um, um, are, are number one, which is, is funding um, and who is going to pay for this work. And I would like to say that utilities uh, up until this point and the expectation going forward would be the funding source uh, for the project, including the mitigation project. So if I'm wrong, they could chime in at this point. So there's some relationship to number one uh, with what we're talking about tonight. The focus of tonight is really on section six, which is uh, for uh, those listening in as what is called the replacement property, which is uh, acquiring the 119 acres, bringing that into the city uh, uh, jurisdictions, and then ultimately to be uh, managed and operated as open space property uh, uh, and uh, by the department. And so, uh, because we're talking about the 119, there's definitely relevance to uh, securing that replacement property. Uh, uh, so there's relevance to paragraph six or section six. The main relevance tonight is section seven, which yeah, talks. Can I, can yeah. I interrupt? Oh sure. Leah, yeah, can you get a? Can you pull that up so maybe the public can see and what we're talking about on on the screen? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, that's fine, Dave. Well, while she's doing that, um, to address some of the questions that the public had, utilities money that's going to pay for the project and the mitigation comes from what sources? Our, our storm, we have three utilities, water, wastewater, and then the third is stormwater and flood. And so it comes from, from that. Which comes from? You mostly use your fees from our water bills, utility, our city yeah. utility bills. City so are we not applying for any federal funding? There's we know federal funding, but we do have Mile High Flood District funding, and they're a pretty big partner for the project, so they're contributing a significant amount of money through their capital improvement program. And in the past, you've given us a percentage of that for the total. Cost. Do you recall what it is? Uh, I don't have the percentage right now. So the way mile high, I could find it out very quickly. So um, I'll have to pull those out. Okay. But it is a significant, they're a significant partner for this project. So we're not getting any money, at least to this point, from the infrastructure bill or any federal funding source. What, what I would say to that is each year we bring forward a capital improvement program that's multiple projects and um, we are absolutely applying for some of those funds and, and have the potential to obtain some for various projects and it all kind of comes out of the bottom line and so if, we, if we're successful that will offset customers bills. Yeah, we're on six. Yeah, so just to briefly sum up that, number one is the funding and, and what uh, the board uh, was uh, expressing a desire is that open space funds wouldn't be used in, in, as part of the uh, flood project, including the mitigation of the 119. And so far that understanding is being held. So uh, it's number six and number seven is really the subject matter and the relationship to what we're talking about tonight to the resolution that the board uh, passed on to council. And that's the replacement property, otherwise known as the OSO. And uh, uh, through the annexation agreement, we are now poised to be in a position to uh, uh, have that land come over to the city, uh, transferred uh, over to the city, uh, or purchased and transferred over to the city. And then uh, uh, probably <laughs> some sort of agreement of that that would be become open space property and managed by this department, Space Mountain Parks Department. 
Uh, number seven is comments that the board expressed uh, desires for with the environmental mitigation plan. And that's tonight was the focus of what we wanted to talk about. And I'll just point to the first sentence here is of what the board's language was as OSMP and the Public Works Utilities Department will jointly develop an environmental uh, 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 mitigation plan. And that is essentially what we've been doing up until this point. We brought Don involved, uh, Don's involvement has has been instrumental up until this point, not only in reviewing the selection of a very specific consulting firm, subconsultant RGH, uh, but uh, OSMP was very involved in the identification and selection of the consulting firm uh, that has been uh, working with the staff. Um, so in terms of the subsets of number seven, uh, 7.1 is the habitat mitigation area. Uh, uh, we've been, that's, a lot about what we've talked about tonight. Uh, uh, seven point, uh, there's also relevance to the acreage and uh, that there was an expression that the entire 119 be looked at for restoration. And I think the message that we brought to you tonight is that is indeed the expectation uh, and the uh, anticipation of what we're working on is for the full 119 to restore. There's been past iterations <laughs> of the board expression uh, perhaps of uh, restoring less acreage than that, but it's been determined through this resolution and working with our staff that we felt, open space staff, that it's really the entirety of the 119 that needs to be the focus. So that was one of the big messages we wanted to bring tonight to you. Um, the other relevance that we talked about tonight is 7.4, which is removal of the levy. Uh, that has now been incorporated into this conceptual design. And 7.5 is the water rights. Uh, that was secured through the annexation agreement. And we've talked tonight about how the water rights are key to getting kickstarting uh, this restoration and then being part of uh, annual uh, irrigation that will support some agricultural use, some grazing uh, in the area, as well as continue to support the restoration project uh, long term. Um, and those water rights come from the same utility fee source as the rest of the mitigation and acquisition, right? Yeah, the whole, the whole yeah. agreement of everything yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. We've touched upon other parts of this resolution uh, about permits. Um, uh, we've talked about, there's another 8.4 also referring to water rights. So those are the, uh, what I saw as the direct relevance to our conversation tonight. Obviously we've had other conversations uh, that have, hit on other things. We've also talked about number nine, which is trails uh, as well. Um, so obviously when we get to the uh, phase of getting more detail with the board about uh, sort of final agreements, final approvals, we will look at uh, documents like this and provide more narrative on how we felt we uh, have addressed it. Um, if we didn't completely address it, an explanation of why. Um, but I think that's the anticipation of using this framework also to as a framework going forward for how would we describe over time how how these elements were addressed. Great, thanks. I think that's helpful both for us and for the public to kind of have that sense of where we're at. Uh, the other question I had in that regard, though, is that uh, this is focused on the 119 acres and there are other environmental mitigation and restoration uh, components to this whole project. And so can you, Brandon, I think, may, I don't know, you probably are the best person to speak to, okay, you know, kind of how are they going to then follow kind of what we've talked about tonight? Sure, yeah, I, I think um, what comes to mind immediately for environmental impacts is groundwater and um, how we're mitigating that. So. We have presented in the past and we've shared our kind of our groundwater report. So we've done a really comprehensive groundwater model for the area and we've included our groundwater conveyance system um, across our flood wall foundation to make sure that connection stays the same. Um, I think that's that's a really important feature of the project and um, we want to make sure that's incorporated. So beyond, beyond that, I think that's probably the other piece of this besides the direct construction impacts that we're talking about the mitigation for right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thanks. Sure. 
Let me continue speaking about that for a minute. Um, the public tonight, someone uh, speaking under public comment, mentioned the possibility of staging construction so that there could be a test since we have not yet found any comparable that functions like this in a flood situation and in a dry year, wet year situation. Uh, is that something that is a possibility? So, so typically with these types of projects is you, you will see groundwater enter the system after construction and we'll have a monitoring system of wells set up upstream and downstream of the project to see the impacts of the groundwater. And we'll also inspect the system. So we'll use cameras to inspect that the system was installed correctly uh, in the pipes. But beyond that, that's probably as much standard testing as we do. Um, just naturally from after construction's done, the groundwater will enter the system and we'll be able to see it uh, immediately there. And our best monitoring approach will be wells upstream and downstream in those areas of interest. And the, the critique that I've heard over the last three years, three, four years, is, is that we don't know how this will perform in a flood scenario. Um, is there any way to test that short of waiting for the next flood and saying, whoops, it doesn't work or it worked phenomenally? There won't be a way to test it physically under full flooding conditions, but I will say the dam safety division of the state engineer's office, that will be one of their primary interests. So that's really their ultimate job is to make sure that the facility is safe, not only in the hundred year flood, but also in the probable maximum flood, which is, significantly, probably 10 times larger than what the 100 year flood is. And we'll look at potential failure modes analysis, which is seepage failure, groundwater conveyance system. We'll look at how water's moving through that in those flooding conditions, um, hydraulic loading longer than the period we've thought of. Uh, so I will say probably the most robust design review process you could go through will be through the Colorado's Dam Safety Division. And that'll happen as it was shown on the timeline. Yes, so we've been working with them uh, through the design process. We've met with them to kick off the six months of design as well. And then that takes me back to not, not the flood wall and whether it will hold or not, or you're calling it now spillway. I don't know the distinction and why you've changed names for it, but Tell us what to call it. <laughs> it's more of an engineering thing for me. So technically it's a spillway. Um, so it looks like a wall, but functionally it would function as a And spillway. is it different than what, what we've been presented as a flood wall in the past? No, it is. It's a, a synonym. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. I'll stick with flood wall. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Wait, wait. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, not the flood wall itself and how that structure will function or not, but the state natural area wet meadows upstream and downstream of the constructed flood wall. And Leo, we've lost camera and sound this time. Oh, can you hear us now? <laughs> yeah, but we can't yet see it. So I feel like you're probably coming back. Coming back. Now that I know this pattern well. <laughs> Thanks, Brenda. Um, so my question is, and, and this goes back to number 7.2 and, and 7.3 in the uh, list that Dan was running through. The, the detailed plan to monitor the quality of the habitat and the vegetation before as baseline data and then through the project. So has that been started or designed or none of the above or where are we on that? So I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so there's going to be extensive monitoring required through the permitting process. Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife Service, City of Boulder, they're all going to require that we have a monitoring 
plan to look at not only the success of the mitigation, but the um, a, uh, uh, monitoring the existing wetlands post project. The other thing. But, but I, I want to know pre-project as a baseline. Right. So um, we've been talking about that to, uh, I think it's critical to, uh, well, I we should say one way to evaluate the success of the ground water conveyance system is whether the wetlands that are there now are there are eight years, five years, 10 yeah. years in the future. So I've been talking to Brian Anaker. We met a couple of times last year to, to um, talk about a statistically robust system of vegetation wetland monitoring and setting something like that up um, with reference sites to measure, to um, uh, basically measure and create a, a baseline of existing conditions and then monitor post-project to see uh, whether there are trends positive or negative that indicate that those wetlands are either drying up or getting wetter, both of which would, would impact the wetlands. You have wetter wetlands, you tend to have kind of ranker vegetation, right. Prior, you tend to have like we're seeing, we're actually seeing in the Van Vliet, on the Van Fleet properties because we think changes in irrigation timing and water delivery is affecting the vegetation and actually allowing non native species and some pretty aggressive weeds to come in there. So, anyway, getting back to what I was talking about, Brian, Brian and I have talked about setting up uh, a monitoring plan to establish those baseline conditions that we can then use to statistically validate whether we have changes in vegetation over time. And where does that fit into the timeline at work? Well, we need to obviously collect baseline vegetation before the project. Um, so we're, we're hoping to start um, to have a, a plan put together this year and do some vegetation monitoring, get that baseline data collected by uh, sometime during this growth season. Great. Definitely before the project is built. And before a disposal is requested. Um, I, I well, we'll have, we'll certainly have the monitoring the plan. Yeah, we'll definitely have the, the plan set up. Mm -hmm. that. And if the baseline is done this summer. Yep. That, sh that should coincide with that. The other piece of that, Karen, is just an extensive groundwater monitoring we're doing. So we, we aren't expecting necessarily to impact the vegetation outside of the limits of construction, but we don't want to impact it indirectly with having impacts to the groundwater. So we've installed over 20 wells yep. kind of in this whole entire area that we've been monitoring continuously since 2018. Um, we continue to monitor those and we'll probably select a few of those to continue on with our monitoring program after the project's in place. And there are some historic wells north of US 36 that we've um, decided we're going to reestablish essentially. So that takes us data back into the 90s um, for groundwater data out there as well. So I think as far as groundwater goes, um, we are monitoring and we would expect to continue that on and be able to build a monitoring program for the groundwater levels from what we've seen. And that leads to my, I think, final question on this which is during construction of the flood wall slash spillway. <laughs> um, it's my assumption that you have to somehow stop the water so you can construct, right? So how does that event have bearing on both the monitoring of the groundwater and the monitoring of the vegetation upstream and downstream? Well, <laughs> you know more about the, de the dewatering required yes. for construction. So. Yes. so typically with this construction sequence, if you remember previously, and we actually have the slide um, back there, but I don't know what number it is right now. Um, <laughs> Somewhere but essentially that. what we would do is we are planning to over excavate our working bench, which is where we see a lot of the impacts from the construction. Over excavate our working bench. Yes, yeah, so that means we would dig down to an elevation that makes sense um, to where we can actually install all this groundwater infrastructure that we're talking about. And to be able to do that, we're gonna have to do localized dewatering, which 
has a very local effect to the construction area and we want to keep so that. Does that mean you do this part and then move over to yes. this part and then move over to exactly yeah because you don't want to dewater more than you can work in in that. So that's typically how these plans go. We, we're not at that stage in development of the project yet, but once we get closer to construction, we'd expect to see the watering plan. Okay. So do you have any idea about how deep you have to go? We do. Um, so it ranges from 10 to 15 feet from natural ground, what's out there right now, because that's about where bedrock is. And then we would over excavate um, probably five feet of that so we get to a level that we can work in a not deep trench scenario. And um, I do have all those slides I can show you just kind of the construction sequence and things, but um, that's how deep the bedrock is. So 20 feet or so? Yes. So the bedrock itself is 20 feet? It's about 20 feet, it varies, um, but we see it about 20 feet and our low groundwater levels are just above that. So that means when you go into the mined out pit and excavate two feet, you're barely scraping into the... Right, so the, since it's been previously mined, a lot of that material has already been removed. So in our restoration area, the bedrock actually... Well, but the bedrock uh, hasn't been removed by the gravel mining. No, that's what's Correct. on top of it. The, has, yeah. Yeah, right. So the two feet into the bedrock, what I'm what I'm thinking is if it if the bedrock is 20 feet deep, two feet down into the bedrock is only a tenth of the total bedrock strata. Oh, wait, I think we're talking about two different areas. So I am move, I'm moving from this spillway flood wall right. to the mined out pit area yes where don said we were going to take out two feet of the bedrock to put in some topsoil potentially in some areas i would say so not across that whole area that oh, not show. 20 feet deep yes yeah, so what we're seeing is kind of this undulating bedrock and we're actually preparing to get out there and do more geotech testing to <laughs> define that bedrock surface particularly in this episode how do you how do you scrape out bedrock? I mean, do you set off little bombs or, or well, just with a bulldozer? Not, not for you... this bedrock. So this bedrock is very highly weathered on that upper layer. So you would expect to be able to rip it with a dozer, which is the rakes behind a bulldozer, um, at least to about three, four feet in this material. Thanks. I had um, a couple questions for Joe. Hi, Joe. Happy New Year. <laughs> um, and, and I think that they require short answers, so I shouldn't take up too much time. Um, in our picture, page three, that shows the spillway with the cross hatching. Are the utilities going to be not in that area at all on the side closest to 36 on the other side of that, nowhere near that? Where do you expect right now for those to be? That's probably a brand new question. Oh, sorry. Hi, Brandon. Uh, Happy hey, New Year. I think, I think there's some fiber optic cable and some other things, if I remember. Uh, yes, that's correct. So what we're seeing is a lot of uh, communications and gas lines run parallel to US 36. And particularly the problem ones are going to be the fiber optic cables because those typically get pulled in a single run to maintain connectivity through them. So they're much harder to cut. Um, and relocate because you want them to maintain the simple run. So that's what we found right now. We're currently in the process. We just finished our topographic survey, just finding the ground elevations out there. We're going out there right now to actually physically locate those lines um, by digging a small hole essentially to find them and then locate them. So they will be, so if I heard right, they will be in that area and it will be, if you're looking at the um, page three picture that shows the like thin cross hatching over the Van Zeef area. It will be the fiber optics that you're talking about will be in that area and on the side closest to 36. Yes, that's, that's correct. Yep. 
So yeah. we, we have a general idea of where they're at right now. So if you look at the 30% plans, we know kind of where they're at, but we haven't physically located those lines. So typically the first level of utilities location, you'll identify them based off maps or magnetic readers from the surface. The next level of detail you'll go to is you'll actually go out and physically locate those lines by pothole, using the holes to pop it. Okay. And then the slide that um, you guys showed us where you did kind of a summary, the title of it was the regulatory criteria under the estimated mitigation ratios. At the bottom, there was a little asterisk that said, Biomitigation mitigation requirements will be provided through permitting requirements. Um, and I had a question about that. Our Boulder, Colorado .gov shows in October of 22 an update to permitting requirements. I don't know, Joe, if you know um, if any of those updates impact this project. And if they do, um, I just want to know if any city codes change as the project moves forward, whatever stage the project would be in would obviously then be updated to the new rules and laws that would apply. So if we said one thing under permitting that had a law that then changed at some point in time during this process, then that would carry forward and then it would be subject to whatever the new law would say. Is that correct to I think that's correct, and probably the wetland city wetland regulations are the most applicable that might be affected by what you're talking about. And I, I believe those are pretty stable and not aware of any changes or frequent changes. But and then um, just because I don't know what this was in that document, it used the term um, out of city. Utility permits, it said any out of city utility permits are approved by city staff to subject to call up by city council. What is an out of city? Do, are you, do you know what that means or what that entails or, or would that, if you don't, then that wouldn't apply to this project? Is that in the memo? Well, it's not in the memo, but it would relate to that asterisk that said the final mitigation requirements will be provided through permitting requirements. So I just want to know what happens if things change during the project because if agreements are made and then things are updated, I just want us as a board to be on the same page of what the changes or any new laws would mean for any agreements that already had been had. I, I would say probably a lot of city departments are this way. We are stakeholders in, in those permitting processes. And if, if an agency is going to change something, we are on mailing lists and we get notification and we get invited to comment on, on their regulations. And so we would typically know a change like that is, is coming long in advance and be anticipating that and building it into our work. Again, I'm, I'm not aware of anything right now that would affect this project. Okay. Um, and that's fine. And then yeah. just moving forward, if there are any significant changes that are made, um, can we count on you guys to update us and let us know? So any agreements, we can kind of attach that to it. Um, and then I think this is my last question, and I can't believe I don't know this, but on that same page that I was talking about, page three with the cross hatching of the strip of land from the beginning to end of the strip, how many feet is that? Right. By, by beginning to end, I mean the short end, like it's a, it's a rectangle um, yes. area that we're talking about as um, OSMP property. How many feet of the short end and not the long end is that? For the width of the flood wall spillway area. Yeah, well, that would be width, right? Yeah, and then length. Width. Yes, nine, width is 90 feet. 90 foot width. Yes. And I'm going to hold it up this way. And then this is. And it's about 2,000 and change feet long. I'll have to get the exact. Oh, that's fine. It's just the 90 that I wasn't sure of and didn't have it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think that's my questions for now. Thank you.
there's obviously going to be a lot of soil pushed around to, to make this design. Is it all going to be from on site? Is it from places like what's popped up on the levee now? Or where is all the soil coming from? The topsoil to line the bedrock basins, the all the soil. Right now, overall on a project, we are in a deficit for material. So we're looking at how that relates to the restoration of the project as well. Um, so we will have to import some material, but the idea and the most cost-effective way to use the material is to not export any material. So we'd want to use all the material we can on site, but right now we would have to import material based on the current one. And any idea where that comes from? Uh, it just depends on what the type of material is, I would say. It's typically, if it's topsoil material, it's a different source than if it's a structural fill or if it's a just a general fill material, those can come from just any kind of like a gravel mine or anything around it. But um, that's, it just depends on what type of material it is and where there's a source big enough to supply it. Seems to me the most scarce and I presume it needed type is topsoil. Yeah. That's <laughs> to grow all the things that we're planning to grow out there. And one of the biggest things we've been talking about with OSMB is just timing for when we move topsoil over, if we move it to the restoration area and what soil makes the most sense to move it to those certain areas. So that Stages, is stage it. Yeah. Yeah. With the transplanting Don talked about, like, making sure if we sequence construction to do transplanting, it's in the right time of year, things like that. So we haven't looked at the overall balance, but we would protect any topsoil from the site and we would want to use it in the appropriate areas um, after that. I don't want to move any soil off of the site. That's too expensive. Don, any ideas levy, where right? you right? Yes. <laughs> any ideas where you could get topsoil? Well, as Brandon mentioned, so I, I mean, it's not your typical like Home Depot topsoil. Um, no, 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 no. So that, <laughs> I understand yes. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, not so in I my would, guckens I would, either. Call, I would call it suitable growth medium. Um, <laughs> suitable rather, growth medium? Yeah, because so we've established really high quality wetlands in uh, sand and gravel, basically. Um, the water is the key there. And a lot of the wetland plants, they don't need or require or necessarily like a lot of nutrients or organic material. Wet meadows are different um, in that, you know, typically they have been, they have become established in developed soil. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it's going to require a lot of um, planning to figure out exactly, you know, if we need, say, say we needed three feet of growth media. Um, it might be two feet of, of pit run, like sand and gravel material with a foot of um, kind of what you would think of as topsoil, or, or I should call it organic material on top of that. Sometimes you can accomplish that with hydro mulching too. Um, so putting a, um, it's almost like a um, uh, decomposed yeah, cardboard, like cardboard mulch almost that is wetted and spread across the and that can be amended with nutrients and fertilizers and stuff like that and seeded either underneath or on top of that to provide that growth medium. And it's largely a way to keep a lot of moisture in the soil as seeds germinate. But it's, 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 um, it's something that will require a lot of planning and not only sourcing the material, but deciding how you want to stratify it if you want to stratify it. If you only need six inches of material to grow some grass on, that's pretty straightforward. But I think some of the restoration we're talking about is, is a, it's a lot more complicated. Right, and yeah. the roots go much deeper than that. Right. One of the things we're concerned about, or we have to address, I should say, um, with the Pierre Shale, it's, it's a very saline soil, or a saline bedrock. So Vero Marsh is underlying, underlain by um, Pierre Shale, and it has, um, you know, that, that uh, salt basically gets leached out of that bedrock and into the water column. And out of Spur Marsh, we have 
we have water, um, depending on time of the year and evaporation rates and stuff like that, um, surpasses that of seawater. So it's very stressful. Only certain plants can tolerate it. Certain plants love it. Um, but if so, if we yeah, wanted the time that you're talking about, right? Yeah. Well, yes and no. We wouldn't want a salt marsh across 119 acres, right? But in some areas, it would be suitable. Um, and, and in some areas, maybe we would opt for trying to establish some of those um, uh, wetland habitats that. Um, can support halophytes, salt tolerant and salt loving plants, basically. So it's uh, the soils are good. I mean, the hydrology is complicated, the soils are complicated, this, the plants are kind of the easy part of it in, sense, in some ways, except for the. Except that they depend on the soils. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So when we get to the point of, of construction for a project like this, how the contractors who will actually build it? Uh, prepare their cost estimates and, and their bids, we will have a set of drawings and we will have a set of detailed narrative specifications. And it's usually a book this thick. And all of the materials, whether it's uh, the concrete for the flood wall slash spillway or um, environmental restoration requirements, that all get, this isn't all left to chance. But, that gets detailed out and specified. And in some cases, contractors have to uh, provide samples of things and submittals of, of what they're proposing to use for materials. And there's a very formal approval process for that. And so, uh, Don and Brandon, stop me. I haven't done this detailed work in a long time, but uh, I used to do it. And, and that. So, there's a whole process for it. And a lot of those details you're talking about, Karen, I think are going to be the next stage of the design. Okay. So this yeah. obviously a key part of this was securing the 119 acres before we really went into our design effort. So um, we're really at the concept level. We did identify the soil amendments as part of our um, line items, but yeah, there's a lot of, with Don said, it's very complicated. And if, now that you're done with 30% design and 60% uh, design, are your first cost guesstimates still holding? Or are you thinking that it'll be more or less or that you were pretty much right on a year or two ago when you came up with those numbers? <laughs> they're, they're tracking for the most part, I would say on the project, like the project in total, like, We've been presenting to RAB the total project cost. Um, and over the last two years, we've been kind of in the $60 million range and up the road around there. And that Six so? Yes. And that includes this restoration effort as well. Thank you. Um, I think this is a quick question, Brandon, just because I'm holding up to look at it. What type of spillway are we are we looking at? Because I'm seeing there's a whole a whole bunch of them. Yes, there are, there's lots of different spillways. This, this is an overflow cascading spillway, which you probably won't see in typical this dam design. So what's gonna happen is water would overtop. Um, you could see an OG spillway where you have your concrete try and follow that flow path. In this case, we wouldn't have that. The water would just overtop as a jet. And then on the downstream side, we'd have a pad that actually is dissipating the energy. So it's almost a free flowing spillway wall. So that's why flood wall spillway um, gets a little tricky. So you'll see a lot of times spillways could be trapezoidal channels. Um, you can see OG, you can see, um, boy, there's a lot of them. I'm looking at drop OG siphon shaft side. So I see all that. So when you say overflow cascading spillway, are you saying the closest, um, uh, I don't know if this is the right way to say a proper definition. The closest thing would be an OG. No, it's not quite like an OG, but it functions kind of similarly. So it's just going over the top, um, trying to think of a drop example, a drop maybe close. It, in, in very simple terms, it, it's a wall that will function like a weir, like you would have in some of your irrigation ditches where the water just, there, there's a, 
a, a jet or whatever coming over the top of it. And then there's actually air underneath the water surface and it'll hit a concrete pad on the bottom. When Brandon talks about an OG spillway, if you've ever gone by um, Barker Dam in Netherland, you see that area right next to the road where there's a notch. And then the surface that the water flows over every spring has a curved shape, kind of like an S curve. That's an OG spillway. Those are really common. So it sounds yeah. like we're going to see you again, Brandon and Joe, sometime this summer. Um, is that that's um, just trying to track to our timeline? So we'll, we're expecting an update on the sixty percent in the summer. How I'd like to get a sense for how soon um, the disposal question could come up, and I, I bring this up because one of our speakers mentioned um, conditions for disposal in their resolution. And I want to clarify that because that, um, to my understanding, was not we're, we're not official conditions. Now, I know you're all doing your best to meet um, the things that are laid out in the resolution. Cal, who was here earlier, um, and I actually tried to memorialize some conditions related to a disposal, but those, these, con these, um, these uh, requests, I'll call them requests, um, rather than conditions are, are not binding in, to my understanding. And, um, and so I just wanna make sure we're, we're kind of clear on that point. You're, you're, it sounds like you're all trying to do, um, to make your best effort to um, meet some of those requests. But if you were to follow the letter of the, um, the you know, every single word in there, um, I'll go back into, well, I'll just go, I'll, I'll go to permits. Um, it states that, like, we, you know, would want every single permit issued. And it sounds like we actually feasibly wouldn't get there before you know, kind of looking at that timeline because that OSMP part, uh, that bar, whether that was green or what, um, included the OSBT disposal process and then the development of an IGA. That that was that whole timeline, I think. And so I think what I heard was that some of the permits wouldn't be 100% there before we got to that point. Is, is that right? And so you could, in theory, come back for a disposal before all those permits were issued? Yeah, I think the best answer I can make from the receiving end of the permit request, which would come from utilities to our department, would be that uh, we would look at, at these uh, 12 different points and we would provide an analysis of where we think we're at in these, whether they're 100% completed, uh, if they're not, uh, some reasons why, and part of it might be just timing perspectives is, Maybe the official transfer of the property doesn't come over to us till we know we have the disposal in place to ask for that property, even though it says in here that the property should be here prior to disposal. Like there could be timing issues, like you're referring to a cart before the horse. And so what we would provide explanations, I would just suspect under all of these of where we're at. And at that time, whenever that request comes into us, the board will have to make a determination of whether they felt how they felt things were fulfilled or not fulfilled. I mean, I guess that'd be my answer. And in, in, if you look, Michelle, in the past at IGAs that have gone with disposals, you can see what Dan has just described. The IGA is very detailed and would, as he just said, address each one of these items some depth. And the way I read the timeline is that all the permits would be acquired prior to the OSBT disposal vote. Is, I, that, is that not true, Brandon? 
But I, I think that's really, we would look for, you know, working with Dan for when the right time to bring the disposal yeah. forward is, depending on where we're at in the project. So um, I don't think anything set in stone. We would definitely need it before construction. That's our one uh, kind of milestone. So beyond that, uh, we'd look to work with Dan and you guys on. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably what the next few months looked at. I think you all referenced that there's going to be more micro look at the timeline in Q1 and Q2 to determine next steps, including when we come back to the board. And maybe at that time, we'll have a, a more of a refined look at, you know, when when the actual disposal application, I'm using the word application with quotes, request, the, the disposal request from, from your department will come to our department. And maybe we'll have some better better timing on uh, on that regards, uh, because there's probably considerations of when it would be best for the project to have the disposal request come in. Uh, I think we're losing you, Dan. We lost your sound. Michelle, you're faster than I am this time. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think that when, wait a minute, there, can there. you repeat that, Dan? We lost you there. I was just saying, uh, uh, I would expect that in Q1 and maybe even into Q2 that staff, all the staff working on this project, which includes open open space, utilities, <laughs> planning, others, will be meeting to look at a more refined, detailed timeline for when certain actions will take place, including when we'll come back to the board and uh, and for the reasons behind it, obviously we know we're coming back for a sixty percent design look. Uh, but hopefully, we, maybe we can even give you a, a little bit better of a sense of when that when we might expect a disposal request from the utilities department to come to our department. We don't know when that will be yet, but maybe we'll get, maybe we'll know more in the next couple of months, and that'll be part of our next update. Um, so I'll ask you point blank: it, Will it be the summer? I would say based She's on- She's getting ready for another trip, it sounds like. Oh, okay. No, <laughs> well, just- <laughs> Yeah, I would say that the she time- to take the guesswork out. Yeah, I would say it, that would be feasible. I would, I would not expect it to be before the summer because we don't have the request in hand. It's going to take time for our department to go through or any kind of disposal request, whether it's internal to another city department or external. But I would say anywhere on that time timeline, that it, feasible, that it would be feasible for it to come in, except for the next couple of months, because we won't have the capacity to analyze the disposal request if it came on came in anytime too soon. But I would say that this summer could start to be a reasonable time of when that could come in all the way through that early part, half of Q4, 2024. I mean, that would, without talking to you all about that. <laughs> no, I, I agree with that. And I, I think we're now getting to the point with this project where we're starting to narrow in uh, on the details and the, the pictures, especially in the next few months, it's going to become clearer to us like what those timings will be. So there will be a revised timeline by the second or third quarter of this year. Not necessarily a revised complete schedule like Brandon showed in the slide, but revised timeline or more detailed timeline of when the disposal process will occur. I think it's fair to say our next step would be to provide you all with an update on the 60% design is when you'll probably hear from utility staff next. That's, that, that's staff's expectation. We wouldn't expect to see a disposition request before that. I would think. I agree. Yeah, we're still working on it. I mean, there's the actual impacts, minimizing the impacts, and continuing on the restoration design as part of this design. Okay. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Sure. I'm not planning on another trip, but I wish I were, Karen. Well, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, utility staff, thank you. Don, thank you. Uh, an interesting night. I learned a lot. Always do when I talk to y'all. So yeah, appreciate, appreciate all the time. Thank you guys for being here and updating us. Um, 
I've just got one brief update, and it's uh, I just wanted to formally acknowledge that Allison Eklund is uh, has left the department to take on a. Has anyone notice? Did anyone notice? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just, it's, so it's, it's my time to formally in front of you all to thank Allison for her service to the department over the years. We're going to sorely miss her, but she's right over our sister agency. She had a wonderful opportunity to take over a communications manager job with the uh, Boulder County. And so we're happy for her. And uh, we will be looking over the next few months of how we fill the capacity on an ongoing basis. So I just wish Allison. Best of luck and to thank us. And if you ever want to come back, let us know. And with that, I think we're done on our end. Well, no, we're okay. And I think we're done on the board's end, so I'll call the meeting to a close. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.